A British Airways flight takes off somewhere around the globe every 90 seconds. We fly to more than 200 cities around the world. Over 45 million passengers a year. A very, very big operation. Once the world's favourite airline... Good morning. Recent years have seen BA facing some turbulent times. Fresh allegations of dirty tricks. Massive disruption is thought to have been caused by a power surge. When we fail, of course we get criticism. The important thing is to learn from those mistakes and quickly. Competition in the skies has never been tougher and the stakes have never been higher. Competitors make us better. BA has to provide a better service. But now, in its centenary year, the company is setting off on a journey of its own. It's going to arrive a bit early. Earlier the better. To transform itself back into the world-class airline it once was. Everything has changed, apart from our salt and pepper. It's a tough world now in aviation, so we need to move on. As British Airways begins its multi-billion pound makeover, our cameras have been allowed exclusive access to all areas of the business. From the factories where the airline buys its state-of-the-art jets... I just think aeroplanes are beautiful. The yeah, aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. ..to the engineers who keep them in the air. When you're working on a plane that weighs 300 tonnes, there's going to be problems as we go through. If you can play an Xbox, you can push out a plane. From trouble at the top... I get pissed off when people criticise VA. If someone criticises VA, they're criticising me. ..to the teams on the ground... One of the machines has broken down. Do you know how to turn this off? I can't turn it off. ..and the people who keep the passengers smiling. If we don't deliver, the airline doesn't deliver. In this episode, delivering the Dreamliner. How an airline gets its hands on one of the most advanced flying machines in the world. But will BA's latest purchase be grounded by red tape? Where is it? I have the original. There's a major menu overhaul. Has design manager Mark Tazioli got the right ingredients to turn around criticisms of cabin cuisine? What about dressings and stuff like yes, that? It needs to be practical for the crew. Just make sure I can open these up. Sometimes they're a bit dodgy. And flying start. Can the team in Osaka complete the finishing touches to a brand new route opening in the Far East without any glitches? I think they're suffering a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the parts got dented, and I think that's why. Thank you. <laughs> For an airline, one of the most important decisions it has to make is what planes to buy and when to buy them. And with each aircraft costing hundreds of millions of pounds, it's a decision that isn't taken lightly. There are orders for new aircraft placed, I would say every three to five years, by almost any major airline. There is a continuous effort to have access to the latest technology. Why? Latest technology is more efficient, is more sustainable, it is friendlier, it gives you more opportunities to provide a better customer experience. The airline is due to take delivery of 73 brand new aircraft over the next five years a shopping list worth billions of pounds. Gavin Shearer and his team are in charge of making sure all that money is well spent. And today he's in Seattle to complete the purchase of a new Boeing 787. And it's taken years of hard work to get to this point. Taking delivery of a new aircraft for British Airways is one of those jobs that you never dreamed you would get. Been into aeroplanes since I was about two. Uh, and I've worked for British Airways for many years. Doing this, is, it's brilliant. The passenger jet industry is dominated by two global players, Airbus, based in Toulouse, France, and Boeing, the US giant of aviation located here in Seattle, Washington. This is the Everett production facility, once home to the legendary 747 jumbo jet, and now one of two factories producing the state-of-the-art 787 Dreamliner. This is one of the world's largest buildings. It's so massive that without proper ventilation, clouds would form in its roof. This cutting-edge facility delivers 12 completed Dreamliners every month. When they were designing the plane, the manufacturers went back to the drawing board, a decision that's transformed the business of flying. It's constructed unlike any other commercial airplane. The fuselage is, is, it, is almost entirely built out of carbon fiber reinforced composite. It doesn't corrode, doesn't fatigue, very strong, light. 
Instead of designing a huge aircraft that can carry 500 passengers, Boeing developed a smaller plane that's flexible, fast and efficient. The latest generation of Rolls-Royce Trent 1000 engines fitted to the 787 helped reduce the airline's annual £2 billion fuel bill and they've even been specially shaped to reduce noise. The wings are also made out of composite. We have several aerodynamic improvements on the wing, some electronic, some physical. You know, the raked wing tips, they provide additional aerodynamic improvements. So it was a new paradigm in manufacturing airplanes. It's 30 to 40 percent lighter than equivalent aircraft, say, 767. Therefore, it obviously improves our fuel efficiency. But buying a commercial airliner involves a lot of red tape. And if it isn't done on time, Gavin and the plane won't be going anywhere, meaning delays to passengers and costs for the airline. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. Where is it? Coming up, the airline has a lot on its plate as it sets out to improve the food on board. Sometimes it's not been brilliant. What we're trying to do now is change people's perception of that. And a momentous occasion at Heathrow calls for a bit of last-minute crowd control. Steve's moving, we've got to go, come on, otherwise we're delaying the aircraft. One thing travellers could always expect from the airline was a free meal on every flight. But in 2017, the company shocked the travel industry when, like some European rivals, they stopped serving economy passengers free food on short-haul flights, replacing meals with the chance to buy Marks & Spencer sandwiches. We had a fairly poor proposition before that was free for all passengers. And when we looked around, the food provision model in short-haul aircraft across the world is the buy and board proposition. There's very few airlines left that actually give you free food. But for the flying public, it looked like the airline was putting profit before passengers. There was a lot of noise when buy on board was launched, but buy on board is not about cost cutting. Buy on board is about customer choice. So what we see is in short flights, uh, we have many customers who don't want to eat and also don't want to pay for it. It was a rough start because at the beginning we <laughs> didn't really prepare for how many passengers actually were going to buy the m and sandwiches that we rolled out. It took about a year and a half, but we now have the same degree of customer satisfaction that we had when we had free food. But even on long-haul flights, where free meals were still provided, passengers were often unhappy with the standard of food that was served. The perception of airline food has taken a little bit of bad press. OK, you know, sometimes it's not been brilliant. A survey of over 7,000 passengers in 2018 awarded the airline just two out of five stars for its onboard food, one of the lowest scores of all the airlines surveyed. Something had to change. Enter menu design manager Mark Tazioli. What we're trying to do now is change people's perception of that. It's the cheapest marketing tool for an airline to get kind of loyalty of a customer and the, the airline shows uh, the customer that, that, that take really uh, care of them. But transforming the onboard food for an entire airline isn't as simple as choosing from a recipe book. Each day, the airline has to serve 100,000 meals in the sky. So the complexity of the company's catering operation is immense. There's about 200 menus flying around the world at any one time. That's a huge amount of that. We're designing menus non-stop, more or less, throughout the year to cover the whole world. So Mark has a massive job on his hands. How do you provide quality food thousands of feet in the air? The journey starts in Vienna at international catering company Doe & Co. We choose to work with Doe & Co because they embody everything around food that we actually want to do. The culture is all around hospitality. Great food, great quality, great skills. They do event catering around the world. They run hotels, they have restaurants. All the dishes that we work with these guys on have been tested on the event circuit around the world, in Formula One or uh, in the hotels or in the restaurants. So we know that people like these dishes before they even come on board. I think in, in general, everybody appreciates good quality. So why should you give bad quality if you can do the same? Uh, and many people say airlines or a plane is a limitation, which we do not believe. 
But getting food to taste delicious five miles up isn't always easy. The dry air and background noise in the cabin can actually reduce passengers' ability to taste, sometimes by up to 30%. And that isn't good news for a chef. One of the things that we do is try to make the food taste stronger, if you like, at altitude. So we did lots and lots of tests around different flavours, you know, different senses. The one that actually really helped us on board is umami, and that's the savoury taste. Things like tomatoes, mushrooms, very high in umami. We use herbs, spices, all these things to increase the flavour, to compensate for that 30%. Things like desserts will taste the same on the ground in the air, because that doesn't really change. It's that savoury, savoury flavour umami that changes. But with the airline flying to over 75 different countries across the globe, it's an awful lot of tastes to cater for. So, Chef's going to do some tandoori chicken now. This is great. This is the development kitchen. We've actually got tandoor in the development kitchen. We've also got this in the actual kitchen that we're going to produce from in London. Obviously, it gives it great flavours, cooked properly, very authentically. Things like curry will work very well on board because it's got the moisture, it's got the flavours, it's got the umami, it's got the spicing in it. Uh, and we can up and down that, that as we go. We do different regions of China. You know, Singapore has its own menus. Um, you know. The Middle East has its own menu, so there's a huge variety. We do something like 17 or 18 different types of regional cuisine. Can we do the uh, stir-fried chicken black bean sauce, right, for Hong Kong? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Oh, let's, let, OK, let's put that together and then see how it works out. Yes, this is a very traditional Hong Kong dish, Okay. Then, uh, the black bean sauce. Um, if you go to Hong Kong, people will know this dish. It's, it's Straight away, yeah. right? Perfect. You see, it's got enough moisture in it, enough flavour, there's loads, loads of flavour in there. It's an ideal dish for, for eating on an aircraft. Big dish. Yeah. Well done, Chef. Good dish. It's a good dish. So, with the chicken and black bean sauce looking like it will appear on the menu soon, Mark wants to find a new meal for the premium economy cabin, or as BA call it, World Traveller Plus. World Traveller Plus is a really important cabin for us. From a food point of view, we're really making a step up. So today, we want to develop a nice pasta dish for World Traveller Plus. So let's try a mozzarella and a ricotta filling, and then we'll see which ones we like. If we like both, we can use them on future menus. Whatever class we develop pasta for is done like this. So, you know, fresh fillings made here. This is what you're going to see on the plane. Yes, we're going to cook it, we're going to add a sauce, we're going to add some garnishes to it, but this is what our customers are going to get. Well, I'll show. With another recipe signed off and ready to add to the new menu, Mark now has the mammoth task of making these dishes feed thousands of hungry passengers. But with just a few weeks before the recipes are due to roll out, has he bitten off more than he can chew? Over four and a half thousand miles away in Seattle, Gavin Shearer has the company checkbook, and he's ready to buy a new plane with a list price of over 150 million pounds. It's an accumulation of, of lots of hard work, lots of people putting together, and to see that aircraft take off, it's, it gives you a big sense of pride. Today, Gavin is overseeing the delivery of the airline's latest 787 Dreamliner. Next generation aircraft like these are changing our expectations of flying by providing faster and more comfortable flights. The composite fuselage allowed us to put more pressure in the cabin, which literally means you feel like you are closer to sea level. And in our research, we discovered that between sea level and 6,000 feet, it's pretty much the same. Once you get above 6,000 feet, and, the, and you travel for long distances, then you begin to feel the kind of symptoms that people tend to associate with jet lag. Also, because a composite fuselage doesn't react to moisture the same way a metal fuselage does, it allowed us to 
have the humidity level be higher than you usually have in an airplane. You don't feel as dry. And that reduced the amount of symptoms of, of, uh, of headaches and nausea by a, by a tremendous amount. And finally, we used the electronic flight control system of the airplane to smooth out the ride. So we have reduced the, the amount of motion sickness on this airplane compared to other airplanes by a factor of eight. But getting your hands on a multi-million pound state-of-the-art jet isn't as simple as popping into your local showroom. Buying a commercial airliner actually takes years and involves months and months of analysis to decide what planes the airlines need and how much they're prepared to pay for them. Even when they have finally chosen a manufacturer and model, patience is the name of the game. Buying the right plane at the right time is incredibly important. Um, ultimately, you have to take the time. You have to do the analysis. You have to understand what are the different options that are available, not just the different manufacturers, but the options within each one of the different aircraft types. So a lot of work goes into that. Basically, what we're doing is we're, we're ordering slots on a, on a production line. So we normally see aircraft maybe three to four years after we place the order. Once you begin to get closer to making a decision, then you're fine-tuning. Is that particular version right for me? Is it not? Can I get uh, the right engine to go with that kind of aircraft? How is that going to work uh, internally together? Will it have a huge, massive impact? We go through all those motions pretty much every year, given all the new aircraft we're receiving. It's a time-consuming process. Every last detail of the plane has to be decided on, ordered and fitted to make sure it's exactly what the company needs and the passengers expect. In-flight customer experience, flight crew, engineering, uh, cargo, they'll all have an input of how we configure this aeroplane. So ultimately they will decide what seats go in there, where the galley positions, how big the galleys are. So we basically will spec the aircraft from, from nose to tail. And hopefully all that hard work has paid off, as today's the day the airline is expecting to take ownership of their new plane. On the day of delivery, we'll obviously have said that the aircraft is, is technically sound. We've technically accepted the aircraft. Uh, we'll sign a number of documents in the morning, and then the money or, is, is transferred into, into Boeing's bank account. Once we've confirmed that that's gone through, get the all clear, and then the aircraft is, is, is technically ours. But before the new plane can join the fleet, Gavin faces a final hurdle. This is the DVLA part. So it's like registering your car once you've bought a car. So it's filling in your V5. The new jet has to be registered with the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK. Without its certificate of approval, the plane won't be allowed to fly home later today. This means a nervous wait for Gavin and his team. Where is it? I have the original. This is what I sell at least back the What, from the, the guy downstairs? Yeah. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. Despite the hold-up, downstairs the crew continue planning for the flight. Okay, we're not on a track today. Staying quite northerly, going over the rocky, so high terrain, and uh, going over uh, Greenland as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But they know that if the aircraft doesn't leave on time, it may miss the precious landing slot at Heathrow, and that would mean the plane's first commercial flight to Toronto in just three days' time is at risk. But at the last minute, Gavin gets some news. Hi, Sam. It's Gavin over at British Airways. Brilliant. That's great. Right. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye. So the certificate file's complete. We've got the certificate of registration, and we are good to fly home this evening. With the registration certificate received, payment safely in the Boeing bank account, and the ceremonial key to the plane handed over, only now is Gavin allowed on board to take a closer look. Welcome to our brand new 787. You can see the lights are dim, so on this aircraft here we have lights that, that dim automatically, electronically, so all controlled. Um, 7 to 232 configuration, so there's a really nice uh, seat in the middle there that's private with more room. It's one of my favourite seats about lucky enough to travel in this cabin. Stepping up for the first time is is you get quite a buzz. The, the cabin is perfect, there's not a single mark anywhere. Uh, we all wear special overshoes, so we're not, we don't do it to the carpet. All the seats are pristine. Um, there isn't anything on board, and it has a kind of new car smell. The delivery of this plane will mark the 30th Dreamliner that the airline has bought from Boeing since 2015. After years of planning, the purchase is now complete, and Gavin's job is finished. 
The aircraft can now be handed over to the crew who will fly the plane on its nine-hour journey back to Heathrow. It's almost completely empty plane. We've got a couple of engineers on board with us today and the three crews, and that's it. First officer Sabine Hargreaves is one of the crew chosen to transport the plane to Britain. This is my first one and an extreme privilege to, to be able to come to Boeing Field and pick up a brand new 787. An amazing experience. But before takeoff, Sabine must perform a visual inspection of the aircraft, something that happens before any departure and a vital safety procedure. It is making sure we're not seeing anything unusual, for example, a gash in the tyres or any latches that could be open, making sure everything is as it should be. After a thorough examination outside and in, aircraft BJM is given a clean bill of health and can now officially enter service with British Airways as it finally begins the nine-hour journey to its new home. Coming up, passengers deliver their verdict on Mark's hard work. Hopefully it's something tasty and if it's not, that's kind of disappointing. And tension mounts as BA launch a new route to Japan. Can I just take them to the securities? On any given day, there are around 7,000 planes in flight across the globe. With so many in the air, aircraft must stick to carefully defined flight paths. Guided by electronic waypoints and air traffic control, this keeps the routes as efficient and safe as possible. So, planning new routes is a complicated business for an airline. Setting up a new route for British Airways is one of the most significant investments we can make. Currently, the airline flies to 200 cities in 75 countries, and 2019 will see 13 brand new destinations added to that list from the US, Europe, and even the Far East. It is probably one of the attributes of, the, of this industry. We're very dynamic. We will adapt to the flows of passengers across the whole world. We fly to those destinations where our passengers want to fly to. But deciding on the destination is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole host of other factors that need to be considered before BA will fly to a new airport. We need to think about things that other people wouldn't realize. We need to think about the hotel makeup in the city, uh, where our cabin crew are gonna stay, catering arrangements, waste disposal, customs and border protection. There are a whole host of relationships we need to start building to get ready to launch a new route. Nearly 6,000 miles and 12 hours away by Boeing 787 is the Japanese city of Osaka, the latest destination for the airline. With demand for flights soaring, the company hopes to tap into the market, and the crews are just as excited as the passengers. I love coming to Japan. I, I come as often as possible. Quite often going to Japan, we go to about 72 degrees north, well into the Arctic Circle. This one's 77. And at night, we get the uh, Northern Lights very often beautiful, but it, it'll be a smooth flight and most of it will be over Russia. Osaka's Kansai International Airport is built on an entirely man-made island and this feat of engineering handles 25 million passengers every year. It's a very busy airport. Um, we have a lot of visitors from Asia, China, Thai, and Air France and KLM fly with us and soon British Airways is going to fly in. BA's person on the ground is customer service manager Misako Yaji. Can I just take them to the securities? She has the epic job of making sure Kansai Airport is ready to welcome the first BA flight when it touches down in just over 24 hours. It's taken months to get to this point, and Misako has been responsible for everything from handling the media. Press briefing, 12.30, do you need to be there? No, to making sure there is enough food for departing passengers. I have a lot of responsibility to put the station up in time. We we'll have a soup option, mm -hmm. which would come, the soup would come with the garnish in there. Right. I'm sure every job is stressful, but it's quite exciting to see the new station start up from the scratch. Masako has worked hand in hand with the team in London, deciding on every detail of the new route, from which aircraft type will make the journey to what stationery the team needs. 
Okay, these are the boxes that arrived from London a few weeks ago. This is basically the stationary goods that needs to be um, used at the check-in. And then this is a box of blank boarding cards. Things like this is a roll of baggage tags actually, so it needs to be fitted in. And then you'll see a printed uh, baggage tag for this one. This is uh, needed for all the hand baggage and laptop baggage. So this needs to be um, delivered up the check-in counter to be displayed. There are a few bits and pieces that we were still waiting for, like a baggage container tag. We absolutely need to know that they're going to be able to deliver the British Airways experience. We work hand in hand with the airport, whether it's baggage reclaim, arrivals processes, uh, even check-in procedures to make sure absolutely everything runs smoothly. Fine. I think our support team is bringing some things for us, so that should be fine. It is now um, 10 to 10, I think it will be. What we're doing now, this is the entrance for the check-in. Um, at the moment, it's not BA yet, but soon the check-in kiosk will be displayed with BA logo on it. And then we're going to have um, a display up there as well, be a logo on it. But with less than 24 hours to touch down, there's still something vital missing from the check-in area. Just checking if the signage is going to go up, but um, it seems like it's taking time. <laughs> With the arrival of flight BA-19 into Osaka getting ever nearer, time is in short supply. So Masako is on the hunt for her missing signs. Well, this is the, um, the baggage gauge that needs to be set up at the, at the check-in counter, actually. This is for the customers to understand the size of the cabin baggage. Although it seems like a small problem, missing signs are potentially a huge issue. Confusion for passengers at check-in can cause delays, and for an airline, delays cost money and risk knock-on effects in the schedule, meaning inconvenience to potentially hundreds more passengers. I think they're suffering a bit. <laughs> <laughs> because it's been shipped, um, some of the parts is big, it got the little flames of it, uh, it got dented, and I think that's why I'm sure the boys here will be able to, to build it up soon. <laughs> Back in London, menu design manager Mark Tazioli is revamping the airline's in-flight catering. He has to make sure that the dishes designed in Vienna can be made in the numbers BA need to feed hundreds of thousands of hungry passengers. The recipes we've developed in Vienna are now starting to go into production here. So you're confident this is tasting the same as we had in Vienna, right? Yes. Exactly. 100%. This is more or less the same batch, right? It's, it's more or less the same, yeah. Very Everything similar. Everything we do here is the same. Yeah. Because we, we do have standard here, and you know, we follow the, the recipes. I mean, yeah. Like that and that. So it, translate, it translates yeah. from the development recipe right. straight into production, right? Straight away, yeah. We focus on individual client needs. So everything we have in mindset is the single guest, the single passenger, and is not the volume. If we do 1,000 meals, we are not doing once 1,000 meals. We do 1,000 times one meal. So every single dish is one passenger and is one opinion, and you have to make exactly the one passenger happy. And if you just think in volumes and in economies of scale, you simply cannot deliver the product which is expected. It's difficult to um, imagine that every dish is going to be the same, but there's certain processes in, in place to make sure that happens. Myself and the team visit kitchens that we're using around the world to make sure that every dish looks the same. There's pictures to guide uh, the staff. Uh, the recipes are written to aid that, and then it's checked by the chefs and make sure that they are what we wanted in the first place. Once the meals have been signed off, they are carefully wrapped and chilled before being delivered to the aircraft. The ultimate goal is that our customer's going to get on a plane and go, wow. So the next step for Mark is to find out if the cabin crew on board can do the meals justice when they're 35,000 feet up. And more importantly, what will the passengers think? Back in Japan, and it's the big day for customer service manager Misako and her team as they await the arrival of BA-19 from London Heathrow, the first flight on the airline's newest route. And with the flight already in Japanese airspace, there's no time to waste. 
It is now 10 past 8. The plane is on our way. So I'm just doing a little briefing with our staff before we go up to the check-in counters or at the gate. The first job of the day is to check in with the airport's operations centre to see if the flight is on time. It's going to arrive a bit early, 9.30ish, they're saying. Earlier the better. <laughs> Next on Masako's list is to make sure her newly assembled signs are safely in position at the check-in area. And just in the nick of time, her colleagues arrive with the all-important missing luggage tags. Morning, how are you Finally, after months of preparation and with press and VIPs looking on, the inaugural Heathrow to Osaka flight arrives and taxis to its gate at the airport. Basically, I won't be on the ramp. I'll be up here, okay. um, be around doing all the turnaround checks. We're going because it's landed. I'm going to go over there. Excited. Oh, my team's on the ramp is ready as well. So, yes. It's taxiing in to gate 36 now. Good. <laughs> they have our flags out from the captain's window, yes? To see the flag of Japan and United Kingdom flag, Union Jack, and to see the first aircraft coming in, yes, I feel very good. The passenger will disembark and then there will be cabin cleaning and there will be catering loading and there will be container loading, engineer checking aircraft, cargo checking all the cargo has been done. So that's, that's happening while passengers now being checked in and, and getting on, ready to board. The departure for the flight went smoothly. We had the flags out the cockpit windows so, um, and we had that for arrival into Osaka as well. Um, but yeah, it was a smooth, it couldn't have went um, any smoother really for the airport. With the flight safely landed, the team have only 90 minutes to prepare the plane for its 11-hour return journey as flight BA-19 becomes BA-20 bound for London Heathrow. But before takeoff, the small matter of a ribbon-cutting ceremony. British Airways opens the Kansai London direct flight. Kansai London Sen, Shuko desu. Please. Hello, Chris. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Captain Chris Hansen will be in the driving seat for this flight back to Heathrow, and he and his crew are well aware of how special it is. It is an honour, uh, and we do a few extra things. We've got some flags that we stick up. Um, and we have a few more things happening in the terminal, so it just gives you a bit of a buzz. So we all feel really proud to be here and really glad to be doing this. This market is set to grow. There is so much stuff happening here. There is so much excitement over here. There is so much buzz. Uh, and there's, there's just been a request for this route for such a long time. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think uh, it will do really well. With the ribbon cut and the aircraft spruced up, the passengers can now be welcomed on board to begin their long haul flight to London. We've been working for this day for the, the last few months. Um, there was a lot of preparation, there's a lot of hard work, a lot of team uh, work together, and I think everything worked out really well the, on the day. It's not the end of the job. Uh, we will have another aircraft coming in tomorrow morning, and we need to dispatch the aircraft tomorrow morning again. So it's, it's ongoing, it's ongoing. Do you want to try this one? Yeah. Coming up, judgment day for Mark as the crew and passengers deliver their verdicts on his new menu. All I know is I was really hungry and I, I now don't feel so hungry. And a special arrival at Heathrow calls for a delicate touch. I imagine because it's brand new paintwork, he's being extremely careful. The big day has arrived. For months, Mark and his team have been designing and testing new meals that they hope will feature on the new in-flight menu. And today, they get to see what the passengers make of their hard work. So we're gonna look at it on the flight today, see what the feedback's like from the crew, the customers. Um, hopefully they love it. Uh, we're gonna try out the flavors on board and see how it performs in the cabin. 
But before takeoff, the Doe and Co team arrive to check the correct number of meals are on board for that flight. The chill dishes are all safely stored away until the plane is in the air. Once the captain has turned off the seatbelt sign, the food is heated in specially designed convection ovens. When the meals reach the correct temperature, they are added to individual trays ready for service. Right, that's the plus trolley. Just need the top to go on that. A quick change into his chef's whites, and Mark can talk cabin crew member Jason through the new dishes. One great pasta uh, with mozzarella, some tomato in it, freshly made. And then the other one is uh, stir-fried chicken with ginger, chilli, specifically made for a Hong Kong route. So let's, let's see what our customers think. Yeah. I had the uh, chicken, chicken stir-fried. It was good. Very nice sauce. It was really hot and good. And the rice was good, which is not easy. The seven-hour flight is not the most riveting of occasion, so you kind of look forward to the food and hopefully it's something tasty. And if it's not, that's kind of disappointing because you're whiling away the time. Um, but yeah, no, I was particularly hungry today, so that definitely hit the spot. I like the spicy stuff. This was light, fresh. A bit of chilies on it would have been good for me. It was great. I think I'd like a little bit more spice on that. I like the, the bit more hot temperature, uh, but it was the nicest chicken dish I've had on a plate. So. I typically stay away from the pasta on a plane because it tends to be a little bit rubbery around the edges, but that was perfectly done. It was a nice bit of cheese. So it was, yeah, it was very tasty. It was really good, but I think it's a little bit bland for my taste buds. So we've had feedback. Generally, people really, really liked it. With the pasta, and some people said, OK, it's, it's slightly bland. You know, we can look at the recipe and look at whether, whether we add a sharper cheese to give it a bit more um, flavour in here. I think we had some comments around the chicken that we need to just add, maybe add a little more spice to get it right altitude. Usually you just get a piece of chicken and some, something that looks like a potato. And, but this was a nice, this was nice. It felt like, you know, Chinese delivery in the sky. It was good, except the chopsticks would have been better. Seriously. But... <laughs> back in London, and it's a special day for the airline. To mark their 100th anniversary, a Boeing 747 has been repainted in the original British Overseas Airways Corporation colours, and the plane is about to land at the airport. It's a sight that's not been seen here at Heathrow since 1974. Staff, past and present, have joined the press to indulge in a spot of nostalgia. Good morning, gents. How are we doing? Oh, excellent. Glad to hear it. Right. Project manager Dave Tubb and his team have a jumbo-sized job on their hands, making sure this giant of the skies with its 60-metre wingspan not only lands safely, but gets into the hangar. No, we are not doing too well. <laughs> we are not a rugby team. <laughs> we don't to know it. We're hosting around 100 press and staff who are coming in to see the arrival. And everyone's very excited about it because we haven't done anything like this before. This is the first in a series of BA planes to be given this retro paint job, all in celebration of the airline's long and illustrious history. I think we are almost the oldest airline in the world. We can trace our history back to virtually just after the First World War. We have had a huge effect on flying across the world. The brand British Airways as we know it first took off in 1974, following the merger of BOAC and British European Airways. British Airways operate the largest passenger fleet in the Western world. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of British European Airways... Since then, the airline has built its worldwide reputation on all things British. Good old British weather, eh? But conditions at Heathrow haven't dampened anyone's enthusiasm as Dave and his team prepare to welcome the new arrival, Speedbird 100. Uh, Speedbird 100, it's great to see you back at BOAC. From all of us here at NAP Search Traffic Control, happy birthday and congratulations on 100 years of flying. That was fantastic, I'd love to see it come in. Something to come a long way to see that aircraft. However, before celebrations could begin, 
Dave has to make sure it's safe for the invited guests and media to approach the 300-ton plane. Now we just need to get everyone into a good position to get, hopefully, some really good photographs. It's going well. I imagine because it's brand new paintwork, he's being extremely careful. He's just starting to scratch the paintwork now. The paint job on this Boeing 747 took a week to complete. Paint adds weight to the aircraft, and more weight means more fuel burn, so the old paint is stripped back before 125 litres of new paint is sprayed on. With the last photos taken, it's time for Dave and the team to get Speedbird 100 indoors for the night. And when you're dealing with an 80 metre long 747, there's no room for error. Steve's moving, we've got to go, come on, otherwise we're delaying the aircraft. Right, just made two free umbrellas. But Dave's got a problem, as the over-enthusiastic crowd are clamouring to get their shot of this queen of the sky. Please, 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 please move. We're not moving until we get him out of the way. We all good? Bring it in. It's gone really, really well. Everyone was very excited. It was part of our problem, really, was getting everyone inside because everyone just wanted to stay out there. Beautiful, doesn't it? It does look absolutely amazing. And it takes, it takes you back all those years to when it, when it first appeared. When I first joined all those years ago, that was the logo. And I've heard people saying today how nice it is to see it again. That BOC livery means an awful lot to me. And it just conjures up all those memories of the really golden ages. First class, for instance, we had joints on board and we carved them and we had like a rotary order and things like that. Everyone that was here from, from BA seeing it was, uh, it was a very proud moment for us to, to see her coming in. I was thinking before, you know, there you are sitting in a departure lounge and suddenly this turns up rather than a, a normal British Airways aircraft and just remind us really about the, about the pioneering because BOEC did pioneer long distance flights after the war. Uh, and through the 70s. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now unfasten your seatbelts and smoke if you wish. We shall be serving you with cocktails for lunch and afternoon tea. We shall also be very happy to serve you with any drinks and cigarettes you may require. It's a reminder that, you know, air travel has come a long way in a fairly short time. You try and be all calm and collected about this sort of stuff, but uh, there is something quite beautiful, absolutely quite beautiful. Tomorrow, the plane will fly its first passengers to JFK Airport in New York. Significant, as this is the first route the 747 flew in BOAC colours back in 1964. And it will remain in its new livery until it finally retires in 2023. Next time on Inside British Airways, the engineering team begin a supersized makeover on one of the fleet. The guys know we've got tight time constraints, but that can't be at the sacrifice of any safety or any quality. We can do everything in our power to make sure this thing doesn't go late. The airline waves goodbye to an old friend. The dear old 767's had her time, but she has been such a workhorse for us. And the company has a fight on its hands to win back the luxury market. It is absolutely critical that we stay ahead of the curve. A British Airways flight takes off somewhere around the globe every 90 seconds. We fly to more than 200 cities around the world. Over 45 million passengers a year. A very, very big operation. Once the world's favourite airline... Good morning. 
Recent years have seen BA facing some turbulent times. Fresh allegations of dirty tricks. Massive disruption is thought to have been caused by a power surge. When we fail, of course we get criticism. The important thing is to learn from those mistakes and quickly. Competition in the skies has never been tougher and the stakes have never been higher. Competitors make us better. BA has to provide a better service. But now, in its centenary year, the company is setting off on a journey of its own. It's going to arrive a bit early. Earlier, the better. To transform itself back into the world-class airline it once was. Everything has changed, apart from our salt and pepper. It's a tough world now in aviation, so we need to move on. As British Airways begins its multi-billion pound makeover, our cameras have been allowed exclusive access to all areas of the business. From the factories where the airline buys its state-of-the-art jets... I just think aeroplanes are beautiful. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. ...to the engineers who keep them in the air. When you're working on a plane that weighs 300 tonnes, there's going to be problems as we go through. If you can play an Xbox, you can push out a plane. From trouble at the top... I get pissed off when people criticise VA. If someone criticises VA, they're criticising me. ...to the teams on the ground... One of the machines has broken down. Do you know how to turn this off? I can't turn it off. ...and the people who keep the passengers smiling. If we don't deliver, the airline doesn't deliver. In this episode, can the team in Cardiff refurbish a Boeing 777 in just 30 days, or will a faulty window throw a spanner in the works? If we can't fix the windscreen today, then it could deflect the flight time. It's not something we want to happen. First-class service gets a facelift, but will the cabin crew cope with all the changes? Well, suddenly it's like unlearning everything you've done and relearning it again. They're, re they're, they're really hard, they're really stiff. You try and open them. And a fond farewell to a flying machine. Just to see the reaction from the public. So many people have bought tickets to be on this flight. To keep their planes flying and passengers safe, all airlines are legally obliged to maintain their aircraft. And for BA's 157-strong long-haul Boeing fleet, that means a regular trip to Britain's largest heavy aircraft maintenance facility located next to Cardiff Airport. Back up, boys. If you liken it to your car, we basically carry out the major service on the aircraft that British Airways flies. In any given year, we can do about 80 aircraft. If we're a really busy year, we can be clearing 800,000 man-hours. The team here know these massive machines inside and out. Every six years, each plane in the BA fleet gets a supersized overhaul, known as a D-check. The whole cabin gets removed. Literally every component gets inspected on here. You take the seats off, the carpets come up, the floorboards get lifted out, the overhead bins will get removed and will get sent away. We can take panels off, we'll send them away for painting. We can fabricate metal that goes back onto the aircraft. Engines will get removed, we will drop the gears down. Literally, we inspect every element of that aircraft. But today, the facility is about to face one of the toughest challenges in its 25-year history. We're here at British Airways Maintenance Cardiff today, waiting for a 777 aircraft to land. Tim and his team have a 250-tonne job on their hands. They've got just 30 days to completely transform the cabin of this Boeing 777, and this is the first time they've taken on such a mammoth makeover. Will they finish the job in time for the plane's next passenger flight in just a few weeks? Off. The team are waiting now to dock the aircraft safely against the side, make sure we don't cause any damage. The airline's maintenance base here in Cardiff was originally opened to service their 747 jumbo fleet. Is that OK? But with the retirement of that plane already on the horizon... Brakes on. ..the engineers now have extra capacity to refurbish other types of aircraft. The aircraft's now docked. We've got the chocks fitted. Ground power is supplied. We test the aircraft thoroughly now. And then we'll start the strip. Tim is the team leader on this massive project and must oversee over 2,500 tasks in order to complete the job on time. 
all the carpets, all the floor coverings, the toilet floor coverings, etc., all will be changed. All of the, the faces of the galleys and the toilets, every bit of the furniture, like the wallpaper, the tedlar, is all going to be changed throughout the whole cabin. So it'll look like a brand new cabin. Moving into the club class zone, all of these seats are being taken off. So by tomorrow morning, they'll all be out from here. This is World Traveller. All these seats are coming off and new seats with new in-flight entertainment seats going on. And new carpets, overhead bins modified. All of the lighting is going to change. Conventional lighting is changing to LED, fully stripped. We're looking at three days, really, to be able to do it. It's a new challenge for us. Um, it's a very big modification. And the guys know we've got tight time constraints, but that can't be at the sacrifice of any safety or any quality. Like with any engineering things, you know, if things are thrown at us, then we've got departments that can assist us, we've got technical support, we've got plenty of people on this aircraft that are very good at what they do. So we're going to do everything we can to ensure this doesn't go late. It's day one, and the first task for the team is to start removing all of the 300 seats on board. But when every day counts, any delays are not good news. And in business class, Tim has found a problem. At the moment, they're trying to release one of the feet, because the, the, the way the seat bolts into the seat tracks in the floor, it slides into tangs. So at the moment, they've got to try and release that from the tangs before we attach the cradle to try and lift it. If you attach the cradle and try and lift it, it's got such a force on that to be able to lift this up, you'll just put damage the seat track, which then means we get into a large repair. So. But with the club seat finally removed from the floor, <laughs> the next job is getting it off the plane. So this seems like the perfect time to start stripping out the galley. Off the goes the first one of another 27 to go. And that's just club class. The team also have to take out over 200 seats from the economy cabins. By the end of the day, we hope to have the other zones also stripped out completely. We then start our modification. That's going to take us another two to three weeks to do. The next few weeks will see the cabin stripped back to its bare bones and every component tested. With thousands of jobs still to complete, the clock is ticking. But will an unexpected delay throw Tim's schedule into chaos? Unfortunately, that window heat system fails on test, which involved us having to change the window. Coming up, will the engineering team be able to shed some light on a tricky problem? I'm trying to work out how this bloody slides in there. Uh... How will the airline mark a moment in aviation history? The galleys have been packed with people, um, just all trying to get things signed, and it's just been a fantastic atmosphere, absolutely amazing. And is the new first-class service running into turbulence? I just use it now, because I think we're out of wine glass. I'll have to wash wine glass. For those lucky enough to be able to afford it, flying first class with the airline was once seen as a prestigious experience. But a lack of investment in its premium cabins has seen BA left behind in the battle for luxury travellers. We sometimes uh, hear from our customers that uh, the experience today is not as it used to be, that uh, things have changed too much, that uh, there have been too many changes uh, to, to the travel experience. And I would accept that. Time to have a day off. Back in what's considered to be the golden era of flying, a first-class flight meant silver service dining, a drink from the onboard bar, and in more recent years, relaxing on the world's first onboard flatbed. But now, BA have been outclassed by some big new players. With enough cash, you can enjoy a shower, personal onboard butler, and for around 19,000 pounds, your very own penthouse in the sky. So why aren't BA offering a similar service on their flights? We don't believe in showers on board. We don't believe our customers are requesting that, particularly when you look at our network and where we fly to and the length of our flights. We do know that our customers are looking for privacy, storage space, uh, certain types of food. We must be there to respond to a demand for luxury services. So we're very much committed to do it. Luxury might have different interpretations depending on the culture. 
So luxury for us is what luxury is for our customers. So our positioning is always understated elegance. In the 2018 Skytrax Awards, the airline failed to make the top 10 in the best first class category. But instead of showers and double beds on board, the airline is determined to improve their ranking by changing their first class service. We will have new entertainment system, new food and drink, new bedding, but really what brings that to life is our people. And the journey starts here at the Global Learning Academy, or GLA, the airline's training facility near Heathrow, where every member of crew begins their career. Being cabin crew is it's a lifestyle as much as, as a job. You can be working all sorts of crazy hours. Um, you're away from your family when you want to be with them most sometimes. And it has its moments of being very exciting up in the air. One day you could be working in our first cabin, the next day you could be on a short haul flight. So you're always adapting to different customer needs. Change and development manager Jonathan Foster is at the GLA, overseeing the introduction of the new premium service with some existing crew members. They need to familiarize themselves with everything from new equipment to serving afternoon tea on board. Today we're in the first cabin mock-up, which has the exact seats that you'll see on board our aircraft. Um, and that allows us to tr take our crew through a realistic environment. Um, I'm going to be introducing our trainers to all the new equipment. So we'll look at all the different crockery, glassware, um, so that they can become really familiar with it. And of course, attention to detail is crucial. Happy now. It wasn't in the centre of the square. I know, it's ridiculous, sorry. OK. <laughs> Afternoon Tino takes over two pages, so there's an introduction to the different choices the customers have, and then obviously all their choice of tea and coffee and other drinks that we could serve with it as well. So we just tried to make it a bit more friendly for the customer, um, so it's simpler to read and a bit more information in there for them as well. That's great. Although first and business class make up less than a quarter of the seats on a plane, they account for around half of the revenue generated by each flight. So, keeping these lucrative passengers happy is vital for the airline. It's really important that we do get it right for our customers. It's an expensive part of the aircraft to fly in, therefore they're going to arrive on this aircraft with very, very high expectations. But will these changes be enough to cause a stir with the competition? And how will staff deliver the new style service at 40,000 feet? Let's give it a go, see how it works. Back in Cardiff, Tim and his team are into their second week of a major overhaul of this 777 aircraft. The engineers are working against the clock to completely refurbish the cabin of the plane. But although the seats have been removed from inside, the pressure is starting to tell. This input is 6,500 man-hours, 2,500 job cards. When you're working on a plane that weighs 300 tonnes at takeoff weight and it costs 250 million quid, there is going to be problems as we go through. The team is hoping to complete this giant task in just 30 days. But with such a complex modification, they have come up against some unexpected technical issues. We've put a new Club World Pantry in. A couple of technical issues with that at the moment. That's with the representatives looking at fixing those problems. Although the team are making good progress, when you're carrying out hundreds of tasks for the first time, every job's a learning curve. Well, what I've fit in here is the new... LED lighting system now gives a nice, brighter, fresher look to the to the toilets. The whole thing is set up on a uh, on a plate that slides in on two hinges, and then you have to bolt it up into the top of the part of the toilet module. Um, and then you've got like a load of drip shields, and obviously keep a lot of the moisture at bay if there is any leaking with any of the water pipes here. These uh, drip shields. They can be a little bit fiddly to fit in, but they do, uh, they do go in pretty well. I'm trying to work out how this bloody slides in there. Uh, but the thing is, though, you've, got, you've got a lot of wire in here as well, so you can't just go shoving it straight in thinking that it's going to slide in. You've got, to just, you've got to work around it, and you'd have to just make sure you don't nick any of the wires while you, while you put it in as well. And this just slides in over two clips and over the top and should just butt in place. And then what we'll do then afterwards, we'll just put a bit of bead of sealant around the outside. And that should be good, good to go. 
When the team plan any refurb, they receive a set of technical drawings from the manufacturer that gives them an estimate of the time each job should take. When it's the first install, stuff doesn't match between the plane and the drawing, and it's ironing that out, so the next time the aircraft comes in, the drawings are correct, the paperwork is correct, the man hours on the task, it might give you six hours to fit these overhead bins. In fact, we take, find it takes 10 hours. If we know it's a 10-hour task, we can plan for fitting 20 of them, we know how long it's going to take. So it's ironing all those problems out. Yeah. All good? Yeah. No problems? Oh, we'll find some. Don't worry. You're right. So, with the team slipping behind schedule, it looks like they may need some extra time. There's a contingency which you build into the plan to enable you to slip because of technical issues, because of material issues, or anything else the aircraft might throw up at us. We're going to need to use some of that contingency at the moment, but that can change. We might be able to pull it back by working together with the avionic teams, with our planning, with our technical support. If the aircraft is late, that's a really bad thing. If the aircraft isn't safe, that's not, that can't happen. As the team works flat out to make up some time, their next job is to refurb the surfaces of the cabin that the passengers will see. We're changing the, the surface finish, the, the Tedla surface finish on it. So at the moment we're removing the old glue. The material we're putting on is hundreds and hundreds of pounds a sheet. So we have to make sure it goes on, it goes on correctly. But the, the guys are good at what they do, so they'll, they'll get it right. Are you rich? No. <laughs> Preparation. It's like when you watch people build houses. Houses go up really quickly. It's the foundations that you need to put in first, and that's what the guys have done here. And then it's just about them smashing the seats in and getting them all fitted. While Tim and the team concentrate on the cabin, a few miles away in the aircraft interiors building, all the safety kit fitted to the aircraft is being tested to make sure it's working correctly. This is a safety element built into the aircraft that nobody gets to see. A plane undergoing maintenance or a refurb is the only time that most of the safety equipment will ever see the light of day. And the team inspect around 1,500 emergency slides every year. The general inflation time of a 777 slide is anywhere between 3.5 to 4.9 seconds to repack it and send it back out to service you're probably looking between 12 and 15 hours. Safety is engineering's first priority. It's the airline's first priority. And ultimately, our passenger wants to get on that aircraft knowing that they are going to be safe. So what we do here is vital. With the slides all tested and signed off, they can be repacked before being delivered back to Tim and his 777 for refitting. As the galleys in the 777 are removed as part of the makeover, it's a chance for the avionics team to test another vital part of the aircraft's kit. The first thing you want to do when you have a flight anyway, you want to relax, have a nice cup of tea. If that wasn't there on, the, on that aircraft, you'd think, well, I'll, I'll go with someone else. And that's what we're doing. We're constantly upgrading the technology to bring us those um, things that the customers want. The oldest type of unit we have uh, is from a 747. And we've worked our way up, and as you can see, the progression of technology is going up and up and up, all the way up to microprocessor controlled espresso machines. The airline's 777 aircraft are fitted with up to 12 beverage makers to help brew the 25 million cups of tea served in the sky every year. Before they can be fitted back onto the plane, the beverage makers are all tested to make sure that they draw the same amount of power and they all boil at exactly the same temperature. It is a kettle at the end of the day, but it is also a, what they class as a vital item. The aircraft will not fly unless you've got a full galley of beverage makers, then, because it's just as important for a passenger to make sure they've got a cup of tea than they have to make sure that the undercarriage is working. Back at the 777, and three and a half weeks after they started their refurb, the team have finally got to the point where they can begin to install the first World Traveller seats in the economy section of the aircraft. Good morning, guys. So you've got the drawings ready. If we can get those out, then we'll start fitting them. All right, thanks very much, guys. 332 new seats have to be fitted onto the plane, 32 in Club, 48 in World Traveller Plus, and 252 in World Traveller. And the two engineers on board tasked with starting the job off are local lads Andy and Josh. It's quite a mixture and a variety of people who work alongside. Uh, most of them are brilliant, but uh, 
you always get the odd one or two, wherever you work. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, is it true that you're the tightest bloke in fantasy? <laughs> At the moment, we're doing this modification, so it's a little bit different to the heavy maintenance that we normally do. Um, but it definitely is, is new and exciting. The first thing we're looking for is to make sure we get the right place. As well as being comfortable, the seats must hold still in heavy turbulence, so it's vital that they're secured firmly to the floor. These holes are one inch apart, so we need to go three holes forward. Metal tracks with holes are fitted onto the floor of the cabin, which the seats will be clipped into. So we're going to line our front seat up with them and slide our seat into place. It's uh, basically a circular foot that sits in the track and then it slides forward about half an inch and then that's where the, the locking mechanism can then sit into the track and, and lock the seat into the seat track itself. So we've come three inches forward. Right, all together. Is the back still in? Yeah, this one's jammed down there. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that's him. What's up? Job done. And with four seats in, it's just another 328 to go. The team will have to work quickly to hit their deadline. It went pretty all right, actually. Yeah, not too bad. I mean, some some seats, if there's something stuck in the track, yeah. usually is a bit of a pain, but mm. that one went in pretty, pretty uh, sharpish. Hopefully, the rest of them will, will go exactly the same. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> the guys did really well, so it's nice to see it going in. It's nice to bring that first one on, lock it into place, and then look at over the next few hours building the rest going through. Once we finish this zone, though, we've still got another two zones to do. So we've got to ramp it up. We've got to get these seats on now. Coming up, problems in first class as the crew get to grips with the new service. Do that again. <laughs> it's really hard. No, <laughs> they're really hard. They're really stiff. And will an unexpected problem threaten Tim's plan to deliver his plane on time? We've got a flight test in two days' time. We've got a lot of things to check before the aircraft takes off. Um, and we certainly hope that we won't find anything like we found today. Back at Heathrow, and it's the start of another week at the Global Learning Academy. Today, a group of cabin crew are midway through their training course, which will prepare them for the new premium service that is about to take off. They all have at least a year's experience working on board, but the expected standards at the front of the plane are very different from what they've been used to. We will be teaching them, obviously, everything about their premium language, about the customer profile. We introduce them for the first time uh, to the products we have on board. The first stage for the crew is to familiarise themselves with the Club World Service. And job number one is to talk through the menu. In a galley environment, we would have everything displayed in front of you. So, as a starter, if you open your menus on the lunch section, you will see that the first starter is our prawn cocktail, baby jam and Mary Rose sauce. So that's the option number one. The soup today is a salaria cream soup, like this one over here. It's not going to be served like this for our customers, as you might imagine. <laughs> it will be served. With the trainees briefed on the details of the menu, they can now put what they've learned into practice. So, to continue your journey on your club world development, uh, we are going to do the starters now. So, one of our crew members will be serving our lovely customer. Miss Smith, here is the starter that you ordered. Prawn cocktail with little jam lettuce and Mary Rose sauce and your still water. Can I get you anything else at all? No, that's all, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Enjoy your meal. Thank you. Once cabin crew have successfully completed the club world course, they can move on to first class training. So what do you think? Address her by name. Yes, exactly. Address the customer by your name. Wines are something a lot of crew are not familiar with. You know, what wine prepositions we have on board. We have a lovely Cabernet Sauvignon, and this one is from Chile. The starters, the main courses, anything really, our customer profile will be judged on the day. It is a bit intimidating, and it can be tough for a few people because not everyone is used to a premium environment. Being cabin crew, you've got to be empathetic. You've got to be understanding to customers' needs. You've got to be able to step into their shoes and know, uh, know what they're experiencing. And you've always got to be professional. Next on the agenda, Jonathan is introducing the staff to the new style afternoon tea that is due to be served in first class. 
They'll just be uh, looking out for how the table's set up, that it's picture perfect for the customers. Oh, how lovely. Oh, Very nice. Mr Johnson, could I tempt you with a warmed plain or fruit scone to accompany your jam and cream? Um, could I have a fruit scone, please? Certainly. But as they're finding out, it's not always a piece of cake. Can we do that again? <laughs> it's really hard! <laughs> no, but let's, sorry, let me show you. Although you can use them to scoop underneath. Um, but if not, if you use it just slightly wider, it allows you to hold and release quite easily. Jonathan needs to make sure the crew provide impeccable standards, as the new first-class service will depend on how the staff deliver it. They're, they're, dry, they're really hard. They're really stiff. You try and open so, them. This is supposed to make life easier for you guys on oh, board no. as crew. Thank you very much. You're welcome. First time with everything. Well done. Well done. He's tucking it in joy lane. That's the best bit. So while the training day has been a success on the ground, how will the crew cope in the air? Jonathan has arranged a special test flight, and with BA Standards Manager Claire Rose on board, he's hoping for a smooth journey. It's a really competitive market, so it's really important that you know, today goes well. But are Jonathan's plans about to hit a spot of turbulence? We just use it now, because I think we're out of wine glasses. I'll have to wash wine glasses. Back in Cardiff, the team have a full house with five planes all in for scheduled maintenance. The engineers work to a tight deadline, as a grounded plane makes no money for the airline. We know that our customers are absolutely dependent on what we do. We, we've got time skills to work to. We know that we've got to deliver an aircraft at a certain time. If we don't do that, if we don't keep our promises, then essentially that has a knock-on effect to our customers because our customers could be delayed. Today, Ken York and the team were running a test on one of the most vital parts of the 777 aircraft. With a list price of around $30 million each, these giant engines can push a fully laden 777 to a maximum takeoff speed of 215 miles an hour. The weight of the engine is around 8.5 ton, so that's probably around five family saloon cars worth of weight hanging from the wing. Although the engine will be running today, it will be powered by compressed air and not jet fuel. But the test still gives the team a chance to spot any potentially catastrophic defects. So part of the dry motoring that we do with the engine is just ensuring that we have engine oil pressure. We're also looking for any potential oil leaks from uh, when we've done filter changes. So we're looking at the hydraulic system, we're looking at leaks in the pneumatic system. A bit later we'll get fuel down onto the engine while we're motoring, just to make sure that we've got fuel pressure and we've got no fuel leaks. If we do have an issue, if we do have a leak, then we identify that straight away and we shut the engine down. With safety gear in place and the area secure, the test can begin. They're highly trained professionals, they know what they're doing, um, and typically this test will be done in a very short period of time. And in just a matter of minutes, the inspection is complete. The engineers just finished doing the test now. No issues identified at all. We've primed the fuel systems. We've checked uh, for hydraulic leaks, no hydraulic leaks uh, with the filters. No pneumatic leaks are under pneumatic decks. So the next phase now is to close the engine up before we actually push the aircraft outside. But on the other side of the hangar, it's not good news for Tim's team, who are at a critical stage of their refurb. Delivery is looming and they've hit a problem. Unfortunately, that window heat system failed, which involved us having to change the window. I'll try it that way. It's not something we want to happen. It's certainly a challenge for them. Heathrow's Terminal 5 is the largest freestanding structure in the UK. In 2019, it was voted the best airport terminal in the world. Today, there's a special test flight departing to New York's JFK airport. New York is a very special destination, very important market for us. The largest long-haul market in the world, the largest long-haul market for us. The journey between London and New York is the world's most valuable route, with the airline's 12 flights a day earning the company over a billion dollars annually. 
and their plane spending 42,000 hours in the air every year as they cross the Atlantic. It's especially popular with lucrative business passengers who are happy to spend serious money to sit in luxury cabins, which makes this flight all the more important. Today, Change and Development Manager Jonathan Foster will test the brand new first-class service on fare-paying customers for the first time. Any customers that have flown British Airways in first before, they will see everything has changed, apart from our salt and pepper. Um, but every piece of equipment is new, so everything is now full size. In the past, historically, airline catering equipment has been slightly smaller, it's all been designed to fit into the small spaces that galleys are. So our challenge has been how can we put full size dinner service on board within the space that we have, and we've done that. Also stepping on board today is Service Proposition and Standards Manager Claire Rose, whose job it is to evaluate the team and feedback to head office in London. From a customer perspective, I'm going to be looking at um, the timings of the service, understanding how quickly the service is delivered. I'm also going to be looking at the customer reactions to new products from a crew perspective, um, how easy it is for the crew to deliver the service. I think the hardest bit for the crew will be they won't be familiar with all of the products and um, the new catering and the new equipment. So I think sometimes it's around locating things in the galley, um, being able to deliver in quite a timely fashion. I think that can often be the challenge. Please make yourselves comfortable. Please do keep the aisles clear for all remaining customers to board. Thank you. This flight will be a real test for the company, because when the passengers are paying up to £5,000 for a seat, they expect the very best. So for the crew on board, the stakes are sky high. It's an expensive part of the aircraft to fly in, therefore we need to deliver to their levels of expectations. As they take off, the team are under scrutiny straight away. In first class, passengers can order food at any time throughout the flight, so the heat is on. And less than an hour into the journey comes the first test. Put the garnish into the bottom of the bowl, soup into the jug, and this will be presented to the customer out of the table. It's just a case of taking the soup out and pouring in a slight little swirl motion. OK. The crockery has been designed so that the bowl holds the exact amount of soup that's in the pouring jug. The soup must be poured in front of the customer, so let's hope they don't hit a spot of turbulence. We've changed a few elements of the service and tried to bring a bit of theatre back into the cabin. And I think crew that have maybe worked in the first cabin for a long time have become very used to the service we've had. Uh, so anything we change on board, suddenly it's like unlearning everything you've done and relearning it again. But as more passengers order food and drink during the flight, the crew discover a problem. I know, but it's, it's, this is one of the things that's good to know. If we're going to run out, we're going to have to look for space to load more on board. Wine glasses. Just using that, because I think we're out of wine glasses. I'll have to wash wine glasses. Thankfully, Jonathan is not afraid of a bit of onboard washing up. Well, that's clean, that's there if you need it. If you want to. With dinner served, the crew prepare their new signature afternoon tea. Looking on, Claire is making sure the finest standards are being met. There's no room for error, and the smallest detail can make a big difference. Lots of work goes on behind the scenes to get to this point. So we've done lots of work in meeting rooms, and then we go across to a cabin mock-up on the ground and we work out where to put different items on the table. It was the cup furthest away, wasn't it? We wanted to see how the crew would deliver and where they would place the different items, so I was just checking with my camera just to make sure that we had the items placed correctly. After eight hours, the flight finally arrives in New York. Time to find out if the team delivered that five-star service that Claire was hoping for. The crew were thrown into it, thrown into the deep end. There's little things that we can work on. It's more around that finesse, so making sure we've got consistent table layups. I think the customers do notice the detail. Um, if it's done well, hopefully it should look very effortless. No big changes, I think it's just sort of those small little details that we need to focus on. With Claire happy with the team, how does Jonathan think they performed? The things I'll take away from here is just maybe from a crew delivery perspective, we just managed to serve all the wine we needed, so we're going to have to look at loading some more of those on board. The crew, I thought, did really well today. They really just threw themselves into it. So I was really proud of how they dealt with it, and they just were able to deliver a seamless service to the customer. Coming up, the airline prepares to say goodbye to a faithful flying machine. This has got character, it's different, it's quirky, and it's just like an old friend that's going. And delivery day is looming for the engineers in Cardiff. 
Will their plane be ready for takeoff? If we can't fix the windscreen today, then it could affect the flight time. That's not something we want to happen. Back in Cardiff. And Tim and the team are up against the clock as they are just hours away from completing a cabin refresh on this 777 aircraft. They've been working on the plane for four weeks, but now the airline want it back in service and earning money, so the pressure is on. Let's get that thing fixed there. Yeah. And that's then we'll speak, and then speak with John. That's, a bit of that's just, that's the attention to detail there. Although the cabin has been transformed, there's still plenty to do before Tim can hand the plane over for its test flight in the morning. We're coming to the final part now. So now he's putting ceiling panels up, putting the curtains in, finishing any problems with the carpets, testing the systems. So it's a busy time. Um, last few jobs, we've got about 20 people working on the aircraft today. The pressure's on, we're working the aircraft 24 hours a day to make sure that we satisfy delivery of the aircraft for its flight test. But just as the team think it's job done, there's a problem with a cockpit window that could jeopardise their delivery deadline. We needed to do a test on the window heat system. The window is heated for anti-fogging and impact resistance. So by warming the window up, it makes it more flexible. Unfortunately, that window heat system fails on test, which involved us having to change the window. Just putting the window lining back on after we stripped it down uh, to replace this number two window. It was uh, delaminated um, and misting up. You know, there's a lot of hard work riding on what the guys needed to achieve today. If we couldn't fix the windscreen today, then it could affect the flight time. That's not something we want to happen. Yeah, we've got to replace this, and we're just putting everything back together now. Yep, job done. Oh. He picked it up on this, picked it up in plenty of time and um, changed the window. Time to move on to the next job. With the cockpit window finally fitted, there's just time for a lick of paint and a spring clean and this giant makeover is complete. We've got a new business class with a new in-play entertainment Panasonic system. New LED lighting, new furnishings, new carpets, a complete colour change. We've gone to a much darker finish throughout the cabin, which is then accentuated out by all the, the mood lighting that we've got throughout the cabin. So the colours can change throughout the cabin depending on the, the time of the day, morning, afternoon, evening. Look at it. It's modern and it looks like a brand new aircraft. This plane touched down in Cardiff 42 days ago and it's been transformed with an all new interior. The team were hoping to get it done in 30 days, but it did slip into extra time. Worked on lots of different aircraft in my 25 years in BA, um, and I've never installed such a complex modification. We're within the allocated time, as we've said, for the input. We always have a contingency that is built in because of the complexity of the modification. We've needed to use some of that contingency. However, we will be delivering the aircraft on time um, as per the, the original plan. Tim can now hand over the plane to complete its final engine tests before it heads out on a five-hour test flight tomorrow morning. So I'm only one part of a, a great team, um, but to have worked with that team throughout has been brilliant. I haven't done this, they've done this. I hope you guys are smiling. We're all scheduling a, a night out to celebrate the, the brilliant work that the guys have done. That'll be a good night out. It's just after 10 p.m. at Heathrow's Terminal 5. As cleaners begin to outnumber the passengers, a crowd has gathered at stand A18 to witness a truly momentous occasion in BA's history. Flight 663 arriving from Cyprus marks the end of an era. The time has come for the airline to bid farewell to the last Boeing 767 in its fleet. The dear old 767's had her time, but she has been such a workhorse for us. It's an airplane that started its uh, career with British Airways flying from London to Paris, which is a 30-minute flight, and then the aircraft expanded its destinations to the point where we are flying to Los Angeles from Manchester. 
The 767 was Boeing's first wide-body, twin-engine plane, and the airline's fleet have made more than 400,000 flights between them. The analogy I like to use, the Boeing 767, is just an amazingly capable estate car. It's like a car where you can fill every single seat, and yet there's still a huge boot out the back where you can fit the sofa in as well. It's a, just a fantastic, versatile aircraft, carry people safely all over the world to far corners, um, and it's just been brilliant. This plane alone, registration Zulu Hotel Alpha, has around 23,000 flights to its name, and has clocked up enough air miles to fly to the moon and back 50 times. It was always an absolute pleasure to get onto this because it's so light in the controls, it's so accurate, it's so stable. It's lovely to fly, absolutely lovely. Tonight's final voyage was piloted by Captain Julie Levy, and along for the ride was a special guest, fellow pilot and husband Mark Levy, because this flight also marked Julie's final touchdown as she bids farewell to the airline. It has been my office for a lot of those years, and of course, to be able to combine this aeroplane's last flight with my last flight is just, I couldn't have asked for anything better. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in here, and it's, it's like a pair of old slippers, people describe, often describe aeroplanes that they've been flying for a long time as such, and I just feel so comfortable in here. So many people have bought tickets to be on this flight, and for Julie to actually fly the aeroplane, for the aircraft to retire, and Julie to retire on the same day, is, is a perfect way to end a long career. So I had to be on the flight, and our kids had to be on the flight. It's so nice to hear that everyone just loves our mum, because we know it, but it's so nice to see that everyone else like, knows it, kind of thing. It was very emotional, I think, yeah. for everyone, and uh, particularly for us, because, I mean, obviously our whole lives, both of our parents have been flying us places, and now our mum's going to finish, and it's all very sad, really, yeah. and we know how much this means to her, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to take the shine off the aeroplane. The aeroplane is the star of the show, really. The 767 has served British Airways well for, for 26 years, and I'm just very lucky to be part of that. But after so many years in service, the ageing 767 has witnessed the world of aviation change dramatically. The trusty old workhorse just can't keep up with its leaner, greener rivals. In the morning, this aircraft will be flown to Wales where it will be decommissioned and sold on. It's unlikely ever to fly again. The modern aircraft are lighter, more fuel efficient. Um, it's a tough world now in aviation commercially, so we need to move on. We need more modern aeroplanes. We need to be kinder to the uh, environment. Um, and I think it's just time for us to make, make way for more modern aeroplanes. Next time, there's issues in overnight engineering as the team have only hours to get a plane back into service. The engine has failed its runs, so it's going to have to come back in the hangar. It's still, uh, still got an oil leak. Until we've got into that engine and having a look round, we, it, it could be anything. Aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann faces a race against the clock. Just under an hour now, so it'll be all go from here on in, I think. But will technical problems throw her plans into chaos? One of the machines that the loading team use has broken down. And it's a big day for Sarah as she's in charge of moving a 50-ton jet for the very first time. Practice, training, perfection, perfection. A British Airways flight takes off somewhere around the globe every 90 seconds. We fly to more than 200 cities around the world. Over 45 million passengers a year. A very, very big operation. Once the world's favourite airline... Good morning. Recent years have seen BA facing some turbulent times. Fresh allegations of dirty tricks. Massive disruption is thought to have been caused by a power surge. At a when we fail, of course we get criticism. The important thing is to learn from those mistakes and quickly. Competition in the skies has never been tougher and the stakes have never been higher. Competitors make us better. BA has to provide a better service.
But now, in its centenary year, the company is setting off on a journey of its own. It's going to arrive a bit early. Earlier, the better. To transform itself back into the world-class airline it once was. Everything has changed, apart from our salt and pepper. It's a tough world now in aviation, so we need to move on. As British Airways begins its multi-billion pound makeover, our cameras have been allowed exclusive access to all areas of the business. From the factories where the airline buys its state-of-the-art jets... I just think aeroplanes are beautiful. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. ..to the engineers who keep them in the air. When you're working on a plane that weighs 300 tonnes, there's going to be problems as we go through. If you can play an Xbox, you can push out a plane. From trouble at the top... I get pissed off when people criticise VA. If someone criticises VA, they're criticising me. ..to the teams on the ground... One of the machines has broken down. Do you know how to turn this off? I can't turn it on. ..and the people who keep the passengers smiling. If we don't deliver, the airline doesn't deliver. In this episode, can the airline's crack team of engineers fix a hangar full of faulty aircraft in just one night? There's always a danger that we might have cancellations, and we absolutely don't want that. The remote-controlled robots helping to shift 60-ton planes, provided they do as they're told. <laughs> Run a little wide there, Sarah. <laughs> and a race against time. Will Sally Ann get this 787 fueled, loaded and ready to depart on schedule? We need, please, some toilet rolls and some soap. There's no soap on board. Every day, the airline is responsible for around 800 flights in and out of its UK airports. Making sure these planes depart safely and on time is vital. Punctuality is crucial for any airline operating anywhere. Those that are obsessed with punctuality they measure in seconds. They know that if they um, position a particular vehicle in a particular way, they're going to get an extra 40 seconds. I've been part of these conversations because 40 seconds on every flight, on every departure, 800 times a day, makes a huge difference. So every second counts. A recent survey saw BA place 10th in the world for punctuality, with almost 80% of flights leaving or arriving within 15 minutes of the scheduled time and the airline is determined to improve these figures. Crucial to this is their army of ADMs, or aircraft dispatch managers, whose job it is to ensure that arriving flights are disembarked, refueled, cleaned, and then reloaded with passengers, luggage and cargo without causing any delay. Bravo Kilo Romeo, which is coming in as the 142 and going out as the 005. Sally Ann Ellis is one of 200 ADMs employed by the airline at Heathrow. She's responsible for making sure that everything gets done properly, safely and on schedule. I will be managing the activities at the aircraft side and uh, managing those that come anywhere near the aircraft, so there's quite a lot involved in it all. Today, Sally Ann is responsible for flight BA-142 arriving from Delhi, but in just a few hours this plane becomes flight BA-5, so Sally Ann has her work cut out and already there's a problem. Unfortunately, it's slightly delayed, so we might have a few passengers that are missing connections and so on and so forth. As well as this, Sally Ann has just found out that on board are a large number of passengers who require extra help. We have 34 wheelchair customers coming in too. It could potentially cause a problem if we haven't got enough wheelchair providers. Right. With just a few minutes left before the flight arrives, Sally Ann's next job is to make sure that the area outside the gate is clear and safe. Looking for any sort of bits that could be ingested into the engine, uh, you know, any sort of hazards, really. I'm happy. I just want to check we've got someone to cover these lights. How are you? I'm all right. Are you going to do the lights for me, darling? If I switch them yeah, on. Yeah, you switch them on. Yeah. Course, OK, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Right. I'm just activating the guidance lights. If you look up here, you've got the 787900, and as the aircraft pulls on stand, that will count down the metres for the captain, so when it gets to zero, it will tell him to stop. It will also guide him just to make sure he's on the stand straight. With such a complicated job, getting things to run smoothly isn't always easy. It can be very unpredictable. You think that you've got everything button down and then you only need one thing to go wrong. You never really can tell. 
At 9.50 and 20 minutes behind schedule, flight BA-142 finally arrives. Now it's up to Sally and the team to try and make up for lost time. Our aim is to get these jetties on within a couple of minutes, especially if this one's late. Knock on the door so they know. Hello, how are you? Coming up, some surprising news threatens Sally Ann's schedule. Customer service manager didn't tell me when he opened the door, so that may delay them coming off. How these mechanical marvels keep the planes flying at the touch of a button. Uh, oh. Almost <laughs> made it. Almost. <laughs> and with seven planes to fix, are the engineering team about to blow it? That's what big test it. Just get my front end. As well as their long-haul fleet, the airline runs a short-haul operation, 140 smaller aircraft that fly on routes of five hours or less. Some of these planes can make three or four different flights every day, so sticking to the schedule is vitally important. Beyond safety, the number one consideration is how can we coordinate that departure and that arrival in a way that we can make it even more efficient. If you're going to travel to a meeting and you're going to travel for an hour, for two hours, you really need to be getting there on time. But aircraft are complex machines and any technical issues can cause havoc with the schedule. The airline has a highly skilled team of engineers who operate through the night to make sure the full complement of short-haul aircraft are available each and every morning. We are a casualty environment. We, we don't want any aircraft here. We want them all ready to fly for our customers. This is the fleet support unit based at Heathrow Airport. Every evening, the overnight team of skilled engineers learn how many aircraft need repairing and when they're needed back in the air. We have a meeting before each shift where it's the day shift handing over to us exactly all the aircraft that we've got to work tonight, the work that's required on them, and then what we've got to do to make them serviceable. Tonight's uh, numbers-wise, it's pretty typical. We've got seven aircraft. If we don't get them out on time, we might have cancellations, and that's a really bad place to be. But although we have this massive urgency to make sure we're delivering these aircraft so our customers fly, above all else, the aircraft have to be safe. So if our engineers aren't happy that the aircraft's not safe, we will cancel the, the flight. Once the workload is locked down, the team need to make a plan for the night to make sure they prioritise which aircraft gets fixed and when. The first job, we have Tango November Delta, our brand new Neo, that's going to be coming into the hangar, so we're going to tow that one in. It's actually got a problem with one of its engines, and these engines are used to provide compressed air um, to power the pneumatic systems on the aircraft. When they arrive in the hangar, each aircraft is allocated a licensed aircraft engineer, or LAE, who is responsible for diagnosing, overseeing and signing off all work done on that plane. There's been a fault message popped up, uh, so the crew have reported that, brought it into the hangar, and we're going to troubleshoot it tonight to find out what's wrong. With defects uh, and errors like this, it can come from multiple sources. So um, until we've got into that engine and having a look round, we, it could be anything. Luckily for the team, Ian has a hunch and heads straight to where he thinks the problem lies. The fault of, I think I've had before, uh, I believe to be this pipe here. Uh, so we're going to disconnect this pipe and leak check it and check there's no holes in it, which is what it's been in the past. And the quickest and most effective way of testing this pipe is surprisingly low tech. Just stick your finger on that. And then the best way to leak test it is just take your mouth around the end. It's there. So uh, as I run my hand down, you can feel the air coming out through the braided cable. Uh, there shouldn't be anything leaking out of here, so that will throw the message off to the computer. It'll sense less than it should be. So we'll replace this pipe and I should fix it hopefully. Now we've found the issue, uh, I'll go into the parts catalogue. It's a picture of every single item on the aircraft. Uh, we'll find a part number for that, that pipe and we'll order a new one up. Hopefully we'll have one locally in stock. If we do, we'll get it quickly and fit it. And then we can run the engine and test if we get the fault back. If the pipe isn't available locally, the repair could be delayed. And while Ian contacts the parts department, Phil is conducting what's known as a daily, a 13-point visual inspection that every single aircraft undergoes every day. 
is to try and prevent delays on the ramp. I mean, simple stuff like this. If it's all checked every day, then you don't have to worry about it during the operation. So just looking for any impact damage along the leading edge from any birds or things like that. You just get to know what to look for. So, I mean, instantly you can normally see if there's a dent or, you know, you're looking at the shine on the, on the paintwork and you can see. And Phil's attention to detail has identified another problem. I checked the tyres for wear. This tyre's almost bald across here, so we'll be replacing that later on tonight. It's just wear and tear from the general roof, so every time it lands, it scrapes it off the tyre. So, again, he'll order it from the same stores. We keep the stock locally for this aircraft. Um, he'll order that, get a nice new one, and we'll sort of refit that. It's the whole wheel assembly that we change, rather than just the tyre. So we need to remove the whole wheel from the axle. And that means jacking up a 65-tonne plane. So to jack the plane up, just a glorified um, heavy-duty trolley jack, basically, which goes onto the bottom of the undercarriage leg. Simple as that. <laughs> So, with the tyre sorted, back at the engine, the new part has arrived. One pipe. Okay. So, Dom will now refit it in the same position as it was, and then once finished, we'll close the engine back up, we can go test it. So, I'll just slide it in. you got two points, which is connected to this one at the top, and one up here somewhere at the bottom. So, I'm just going to slave it in and then find which way the feet it would go properly. And with the new pipe fitted, it just remains for Ian to sign off. Yeah, so once Tom's finished, um, oh, he's shown me what he's done. Uh, I've checked that over. So now I'm just having a quick check around. No tools have been left inside. There's nothing else wrong in the area. So it's just a peace of mind thing before we close the engine. Want to close it up? The only way to test this engine to see if we've cleared the seat is to start the engine. So this particular component needs air rushing through it. So that, to get that, we need to start it. The only way of getting enough air through the new part is to run the engine at takeoff power, and the team can't afford any setbacks. If this doesn't pass the test, we've got to go back to the drawing board a bit. This is critical. Back at Terminal 5, aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann has a problem on her hands. With only three hours to go before the plane departs for Japan, she receives some last minute information about a passenger. We have on board um, an unnotified uh, customer who actually needs to be lifted out of their seat and into a wheelchair. But when she arrives at the plane, it looks like the crew have sprung into action. Oh, the gentleman's here. Yes. You've managed... OK, OK, let me go on. The gentleman's here, my darling. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. The crew have managed to um, bring the gentleman off in the iron chair that they have on the aircraft. So these guys will be able to just transfer the gentleman into his chair, thankfully. As soon as it's confirmed that all the passengers have disembarked, Sally Ann can board the plane and begin the process of getting it ready for its next flight. First job is to check there are no technical problems. Hi, guys. Any issues? Uh, not at the moment. Not, not at the moment. moment. Log, it's 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 OK. Up, just cabin maintenance. Fine. So. OK, cool. So what's going to happen next? Hopefully the cleaners will, will arrive. As you can see, it's been a nine-hour flight, and uh, it does need a bit of spring cleaning, I think, really. It was an overnight flight, hence all the pillows, blankets all over the place. We have left to go now, um, one hour fifty. We have cleaners and on the other side we have caterers. And we have caterers here at the middle door as well. Already cargo is being dropped at the rear of the aircraft. This is cargo for the outbound flight. Every year, the airline handles over half a million tonnes of cargo through its air freight business, carrying everything from life-saving medicine to family pets. 
On Sally Ann's flight to Tokyo today, the team have to deal with 5,000 kilos of cargo, including a consignment of fresh flowers, and that's on top of 3,700 kilos of luggage. With loading underway, Sally Ann turns her attention to making sure she has all of the 230 meals needed for this flight. The food is delivered fresh from the catering company and loaded onto the plane. These have got seals on, but it'll have. It's just a double check. Just seeing if you've got the flight number on it. I mean, I know it's been done. Yes, it has. Right. Now, that flight number's there. It's so, I'm happy now that the caterers have been on. You can see here we've got catering, if I can open up. Catering here. This all looks very fresh. So, with the food safely stowed away, Sally Ann now has to sign off on the cleaning before any passengers are allowed to board. It's all very quiet. This looks as if it's kind of ready to go. Looks good. It's all clean and it's all catered. So, um, that's good. That's very good. So, it's all waiting for crew and passengers. Back up at the gate, the boarding team are also getting ready for the arrival of passengers for flight BA5. Morning, everybody. <laughs> Afternoon, even. How are you? I'm well, thank right. you. Good, today. yes. New self boarding gates? Yep. Yeah? Cool. We've got the team, uh, we've got customers, we've called the customers across, we're just setting up, yep. and um, I'll wait for your call. I'll give you a call, yep, um, just in case we're not quite ready, but Absolutely. I'm anticipating we will be. But with less than an hour before the flight is due to leave for Tokyo, Sally Ann's list of jobs seems endless. I'm going to go down to our little pod downstairs. I'm going to prep the flight, print a load sheet out for the captain, um, hopefully catch up with the loading team, and hopefully we should have some cabin crew. At this stage, even the slightest glitch could put the whole schedule in jeopardy. And as ever, the clock is ticking. Just under an hour now, so... It'll be all go from here on in, I think. Coming up, will a vital engine test throw a spanner in the works for Neil? If there is a failed test, we could be put under real pressure then. Will the remote-controlled robots tow the line at Heathrow? Ah, oh, almost made it. <laughs> almost. <laughs> and aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann gets bogged down with paperwork. We need, please, some toilet rolls and some soap. There's no soap on board. In the fleet support unit, the team are in the middle of another busy night. There are seven aircraft in for overnight maintenance, and the airline needs as many as possible ready for the first wave of flights out of Heathrow in the morning. Our customers expect us to be punctual, and our entire flying programme is built around us operating on time. Um, so for us to be able to, to keep to those schedules, we've got to deliver the punctual operation, otherwise we haven't got enough resources. It's the early hours, and Neil and the team are managing to keep to their busy schedule but a call from the operations team is about to throw a spanner in the works. Oh, yeah, we'll see what we can do. All right. Uh, Keith, can yes, you just yeah. go see the guys to see if we can get that Neo up a bit earlier? We just have, they've had a bit of an issue over at the terminal. So Steve just phoned us from Main Troll and said that there's, uh, there's an issue over in the terminals with one of the aircraft that he's dealing with at the moment. And he's asked if we can get an aircraft up sooner to cover the risk of this problem. Um, so we're basically just going to go and see if we can deliver the Neo earlier. If the problem with the faulty plane at Terminal 5 can't be resolved, there's a very real possibility that Neil will need to get the Neo ready to fly earlier than planned. And that means taking it straight to the engine test area, or as it's known, the run pen. The way this engine run pen's been built, there's a large slope at the back, and that allows all the thrust that these engines produce to be diverted upwards and away safely without doing any damage. So Ian and his team, whilst he's carrying out this engine test, he's going to be looking at the instruments, and particularly down the centre of the cockpit, there's a couple of screens that will indicate to the pilots any error messages that are on the aircraft. And so we're hoping that there's going to be no messages on there and that we've got a successful uh, test and that means we've got serviceable aircraft. If there is a failed test, we could be put under real pressure then because then there's a chance that we may not deliver for the morning flights. 
Um, so we really need this test to come good. We're taking up to about 75 to 80 percent of its maximum power, which on these is around 25,000 pounds per engine. So it's quite high. Uh, aircraft will bounce around a little bit, but we'll have our feet firmly on the brakes. So I'm going to turn all the fuel pumps on, dry the engines. Let's start one. Uh, Phil, clear to sign number two. We're going to sit on the brakes so the aircraft will move forward. It bounces around a bit, and the, the, the guy stood outside the brave man, trusting us not to come off the brakes. Take off power, we had no faults, we would have got the message popping up in here. So I'm looking to worry about aircraft sticks. It's fantastic, it's a great result for us. Keith? Yeah, TTMD is serviceable ready for the morning. Yeah. Done. This is one down, we've got six to go. Over the next three hours, Neil and the team managed to shift another four planes off the casualty list. And this means you'll have some good news for the regular 3 a.m. call over with the rest of the airline's operations team. The three o'clock call over is critical. That's where the ops will determine what aircraft they've got to use for service. It's our point where we then deliver and say what we are confident that we will be producing at six that morning. Right, morning everybody. It's uh, Steve and Stu in Main Troll. Who's there from the FSU? It's Neil. We're in the FSU. All right then, Neil. Give us a rundown of your aircraft, please. Okay. Oh, they've got beautiful. Cup of whiskey, that'll be good for the morning. We had uniform, uniform golf. The airline operates around 140 short haul aircraft, 40 of which are based at Heathrow. But if one is out of commission, it's not necessarily as simple as swapping it with another available plane. We have five different types and they're all different sizes and they take different passenger loads. So in simple sense, if one of the larger aircraft doesn't come up, we may not have a, an aircraft with enough capacity for our passengers, and that's the sort of issue we would have. <coughs> Who's there from T5? Good morning, Steve. It's Bruce and another Steve. Morning, Bruce. Any issues? Yes, we've got um, a couple of issues. Just a little concern, an echo Delta Lima, chasing that up with the flight crew. During that call, you would have heard Bruce talking about his problem with echo Delta Lima. Now, when I pick things up like that early in the evening, I look around for other opportunities and I recognise that Neil may have been able to produce his aircraft one and a half hours early. We've got Tango, November, Delta. This one... Uh, we've managed to bring forward. Uh, it will be able to declare it at four this morning. So that will be good. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good morning. Yeah, so we just got off the uh, 0300 call over and we found out that we've got two casualties coming over. So we're into action stations, really, because the aircraft that we've got left to deliver tonight, they have to be delivered. So although the NEO is going to be delivered early, Neil and the team have got a lot more work to do yet. As part of the turnaround process here at Heathrow's Terminal 5, an army of remote-controlled robots are helping to reduce delays to short-haul departures. These have been used right across T5A building now, so uh, there's one of these on every stand. There's probably about 80 departures a day, uh, and each individual motor talk will do anywhere between 10 and 20 pushbacks on each stand. The pushback process is a vital part of getting planes into the air. As they have no reverse gear, Aircraft need to be manoeuvred away from the gate, or pushed back, before they can use the power of their engines to move forward. Before the motor top was introduced, the dispatcher would call up for uh, an aircraft movements tug to push the aircraft back. But if that aircraft tug is engaged or delayed on another departure, obviously that's going to hold up the uh, operation. So, using these machines to assist with the short-haul departures frees up tugs for the larger aircraft but moving planes loaded with passengers and fuel is a high-stakes business. Today, trainee ramp supervisor Sarah is at Heathrow for her final training session before she attempts her first solo pushback on the 60-ton Airbus A319. 
Sarah's been on training with me now for seven days, and today's going to be the day where she gets to push an aircraft out without me walking beside her. I'm excited because obviously not everyone gets to push out a multi-million pound plane, you know? But nervous. It's a multi-million pound plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say it's quite a, a big moment, yeah, because they kind of rely on us to say left a bit, right a bit, and stop there, or watch out for this, or watch out for that. And basically, she's going to be on her own, so it's going to be a little bit scary for her. He's always been there, so once he leaves me, that's it, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Flight delays can be costly to an airline, and using these remote-controlled vehicles has reduced pushback-related delays by 70%. It's um, controlled by a remote control, uh, obviously you've got forward and backward control and the right stick does the left and the right hand but because it's designed to actually push the aircraft back the controls are opposite so if you want the motor top to go right it actually goes left so you've got to be mindful of, uh, of that. The area in the middle is the cradle area which connects onto the aircraft nose wheel. It's got various hydraulics in there um, which obviously open the cradle, which lower the cradle, uh, which operate the paddles which clamp down onto the top of the aircraft tyres and it's obviously got hydraulics that lift the aircraft up as well. But before trainee Sarah can fly solo, she has to prove to instructor Martin that she can keep her cool under pressure by completing this dummy run. OK, Sarah, what I want you to do today is actually manoeuvre the motor top out of the parking bay and slalom round the two cones and park it in the opposite bay. OK. OK, okay let's yeah. go for it. Let's give it a try. Let's try it. Nice and slowly does it. Yep. The idea is, is to use nice, slow inputs on the control sticks and then the motor top reacts in a nice, smooth manner and a much more controlled manner as well. OK. As soon as that's level with the cone, put the turn on. Well done. Close as you can get without touching it. I'm not touching that, am I? Did I touch it? That's it, and round you go. Oh. Run a little wide there, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Ooh>. almost <laughs> made it. Almost. <laughs> Well done, Sarah. How do you feel after that? I'm getting there. I'm picking it up. <laughs> going forward is a lot easier than going backwards. So far, so good. But has Sarah's confidence grown enough to do the same thing with a plane attached? Cones you can hit with a plane. There's no mistakes. Back at the departures gate, Sally Ann Ellis is in charge of getting flight BA5 ready to take off for Tokyo in less than an hour's time. I am looking to see if we have a slot. I'm looking to see how many flight crew we have. The cargo is loading, and the plane has been cleaned and restocked with food and water. So her next job is to make sure there is enough fuel on board for its 6,000-mile trip. 67 tonnes of fuel this is going to take, so... A fair amount. We're almost full. I think we've got two empty seats left at the moment. Um, that's about it, really. So I'm going to go upstairs. I'll see the fueler first. Um, I should go upstairs, check with the cabin crew, because we want to start boarding in about six minutes. So let's go. Hello. 67, please. Do you want that? I'll take the Might as well. Just Okay, all right. All I did, I confirmed the fuel figure with him. Now, he should have already picked it up on his iPad, but I just wanted to make sure, because sometimes you might find that he doesn't know or there's a discrepancy. So that's all I did. So he now knows he's got 67 tonnes to go on board. Now that the fuel load has been confirmed, Sally Ann heads back to the plane to meet the crew. We're going upstairs, catch the cabin crew. Um, agree a time with them for boarding, which, as I say, should be very shortly. All of a sudden, it just starts to go, and more and more people start to appear. Also, 11 of us today. 11 of you today, yeah. smashing. Yeah, and three flight crew, obviously. 11 and three. Um, well, I think a bit. Uh, we need some more soap, please, because we need to put any soap on in the okay. toilets and the toilet bowls. 
the got toilet the rolls. Got the uh, things, but OK, all right, my darling, no problem. OK, we okay. should start up there in two minutes. Sure, no problem. Will that yeah, be all right with I'm you? Sure I'll just check with the crew. OK. And, um, I'll, I'll give them a shout and I'll say well. a, yeah. a couple yeah. couple of minutes sure and then we'll get going. So 3 and 11. OK. Cool. Thanks. Although the aircraft is now ready to start receiving passengers, Sally Ann's job is far from over. A couple of minutes, isn't it? Is it uh, six minutes past? Yeah, a couple of minutes and send them down, my lovely. That's great. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Right. I'm now going to go and see the flight crew. Hello, hi. hi. How's it hi. Going? Oh, it's, it's looking good, actually. We're just about to start boarding. We've got all the freight out there, the loaders are here. Um, there's your load sheet. Uh, my number's on there should you need me. All right, I'll see you in a bit. OK, thanks. Perfect. I'm doing your toilet rolls Lovely. and your soap so now. OK, I'll go and release them to you. <laughs> Hello, it's Sally here. I'm on the 005, which is Bravo Kilo Romeo on 534. We need, please, some toilet rolls and some soap. There's no soap on board. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Sally Ann now needs to get back to the departure gate to check that the passengers have started to come through. Boarding is underway. We did start on time, 44 minutes before departure. So, it's looking good. But sometimes looks can be deceptive. I've just noticed we have one of our wheelchair passengers travelling today has their own wheelchair with them that will have to go in, down into the hold. So I'd rather like to get them here early so we can take it down and I can find out what kind of wheelchair it is. I'm assuming it's a manual, but never assume anything. It could it could end up being it could be an electric one, in which case we'll need to do some rearranging. Late passengers can cause serious problems for the airline. It's their policy to start offloading missing passengers' bags 12 minutes before departure. And if customers arrive once that process has started, they won't be able to fly. So it's vital Sally Ann tracks down her absent passenger. How are we doing, Harvey, with these yeah. wheelchair to gate? I just told him to make a call in the lounge, to tell him to come here ASAP. Uh, 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 I hope Is it just there. a manual wheelchair? It's not saying electric. We're trying to track the wheelchairs because if we get a wheelchair to the gate late and it needs to go into the hold, it does delay the loading. So we're going to try and get them, try and get them down here. I hope not too long. And as well as the missing wheelchair passenger, Sally Ann is also on the lookout for a further 48 passengers who haven't arrived yet. Will she be able to find them all in time or will the flight have to be delayed? Coming up, will a last-minute technical glitch cause chaos for Sally Ann? One of the machines that the loading team uses has broken down, which will delay loading slightly. And is the night shift's luck about to take a turn for the worse? So, um, not quite how we had planned. On the other side of the airport, trainee ramp supervisor Sarah is about to fly solo for the very first time as she attempts to manoeuvre the Airbus A319 with a remote-controlled pushback vehicle. Sarah's every move will be assessed by instructor Martin Cox, who's been operating these machines since they were introduced to the airline in 2017. I was a bit sceptical at first, but uh, as soon as I got to use it, I was uh, quite, quite impressed with it, to be honest. And while Martin was also impressed by Sarah's performance as she navigated around the traffic cones, now he needs to be confident she can safely lift and manoeuvre an actual aircraft. I'm looking that she's um, not doing things too fast, she's taking her time, and that she's doing everything in a safe and controlled manner. The first stage is to attach it safely and securely to the aircraft's nose wheel. But I reckon that's one of the hardest parts, because if you remove it and it's not completely aligned, you can take the tyre with it. That part was done well. Let's see stage two. You keep your eye on the steering limitation marks. Yeah. Keep it nice and slow. OK. Away you go. Just correct it, so if the tail starts to go to the right, just steer to the left and vice versa. OK. Um, once the uh, main wheels have crossed the double white lines, then we'll start to put a bit of right turn on to okay. start the turn. Here 
It's on the line. It's on the line. She's got the nose wheel on the centre line, so she's, she's done really well there. With the aircraft in the right position, Sarah can breathe a sigh of relief. But what's the verdict on her performance? <laughs> Congratulations on your first push, Sarah. Great job. It was good. I think I've done really well. I'm proud of myself. Mine's proud. So I'm happy. I'm happy. Well, Sarah's done really well. I'm really pleased. She's been listening to what I've been telling her. And she's taken it all on board. And, uh, yeah, she just demonstrated a perfect push there. So big well done to you, Sarah. <laughs> Round you go. Less speed, more steering. He'll always be in my ear. Like, he, he might not be there, but he will always be in my ear, you know? He's in my head now. He's in my head. <laughs> How did it feel doing it on your own? It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Back at gate 34, aircraft dispatch manager Sally Ann Ellis is on the hunt for missing passengers. Um, we still have 52 passengers to board. And then a welcome sight. This is good news seeing all these people coming down now. But now it's not just absent passengers causing Sally Ann problems. How far are you into it all? OK, thanks, bye-bye. There you go, you see, best laid plans. One of the machines that the loading team used has, has broken down, so they've had to go and get another one, which will delay loading slightly. But although there's a problem for the loading team outside, it looks like Sally Ann is having better luck at the gate. Hi there, how are you? Hi. Finally, she's located her missing passenger. OK, you're right. Or has she? And this is Do we 32. Th are you going on which flight? Seattle you? 49. No, you're on the wrong flight, I'm afraid. But at the last moment... You're going to Narita? Yeah, oh, OK. Do you want to come straight round here? Please, that's great. The first customer was for the wrong flight. They've just got married. They're going on a month's holiday, including cruises, and going to Japan and Russia. So it's nice to see you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. With boarding complete, have the cargo team finished loading in spite of their faulty kit? They're just finishing off, so I'm happy with that. And with that good news, it's back up to the plane to confirm everything with the crew. It's a lot of up and down. And me with a bad back as well, but it's all right. <laughs> Did you get your soap and... You've got a soap Perfect. Lovely. Lovely. Thanks ever so much. Have a good trip, yeah. won't you? See you soon. Yeah. Nice to do business. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right, that's that. Let's get this off. Finally, after one last visual inspection, flight BA5 to Tokyo leaves the gate right on schedule. It has been a good team effort. You know, everyone's done a smashing job, and you can't ask more for that than that, really, can you? So, uh, good day. In the fleet support unit, the overnight shift is drawing to a close. The team have had a successful night delivering six planes back to the airline. The last aircraft on the casualty list is Uniform Oscar Golf. Andy and his team are, are looking at number one engine over here. It's got high oil consumption, so we're trying to find an oil leak with it. We found one earlier, our day shift found an oil leak. We take the spinner off, that was leaking under there, so they've changed the seal in there, that's cured it. As a follow-up, we have to do uh, an internal inspection using our boroscope equipment. So our boroscope's a fibre-optic camera with a lens on the end, so it can go inside a hole, a boroscope point in the engine, and we can see inside the engine, see the blades internally in the engine without having to pull it all apart. So through the bleed port, I can get access to the LP compressor, which is the front section of the engine. I'm trying to get to the bottom of the blade and then see if there's any oil. Right, so this, this is the LP compressor, the very tip of it, and then we're just seeing to make sure it's clean. As you can see, it's very clear, very clean. And make sure there's no oil deposits on this. 
and this is a good one. So, Alex, are you ready to turn? Yeah. So just turn very slowly, just for now. Right, there we go, and you can see the LP compressor turning around. And then we just check all the blades, nice and slowly. And we're looking for, like an oily run on the tips. But this is dry, this is clean, this is good. Yeah, it looks good, Alex, thank you. That's that, that's all good. So, with the oil leak repaired and after a thorough internal inspection, the obligatory engine test seems like a mere formality. But when the results come back, the news is disappointing. Uh, we've still got a leak and it's come back in for further investigation. OK, OK. So, um, not quite how we had planned, but we're, um, we're uh, safety's first. We've got to make sure the aircraft's safe, so. You know, Andy's got to be happy with, to sign it off, so we've got to do a bit more investigation. Luckily enough, because we've delivered so many other aircraft tonight, the operation's not affected. So this is this is just us. We wanted all, all seven. So it looks like it may only be six, but still, still a good result. It's now up to Neil to let the ops control team know that there'll be one plane short in the morning. Uh, the LAE on Uniform Oscar Golf just informed us that the engine has failed its runs. So it's going to have to come back. We were straight on the phone to Ops and to Main Troll to say um, UOG is not going to make it this morning, and so they were aware. But we did have three standby aircraft. So with this one um, failing its test, it's dropped us down to two standby aircraft. So we've still got a large safety margin within the uh, operation today. So while the night shift might have ended in disappointment, with six out of seven faulty aircraft out of the hangar and safely back in service, it's not surprising that Neil is proud of his team's performance. The NEO was a great result. The team did brilliantly on it. We got a really early find on it. They worked quickly, efficiently and safely, and they got a superb result. And it actually turned out that the operation really needed that aircraft. And so having that early result meant that we could offer it back sooner to make sure that there was no services uncovered this morning. I'm done, but then do it all again tonight. Next time on Inside British Airways, will the arrival of the airline's first new type of plane in six years have a bumpy landing? That's going to be a bit of a challenge. Their design team, their engineering need to assess and, and come up with a, a design solution for that. There's turbulence ahead as the flight crew get to grips with a new simulator. Go around. Wind here ahead. Wind should take it. And the airline's HQ prepares for a royal flying visit. The Queen is in the building, ladies and gents. We have a turquoise outfit, which I think goes with the blue carpet, that's OK. A British Airways flight takes off somewhere around the globe every 90 seconds. We fly to more than 200 cities around the world. Over 45 million passengers a year. A very, very big operation. Once the world's favourite airline... Good morning. Recent years have seen BA facing some turbulent times. Fresh allegations of dirty tricks. Massive disruption is thought to have been caused by a power surge. At a when we fail, of course we get criticism. The important thing is to learn from those mistakes and quickly. Competition in the skies has never been tougher and the stakes have never been higher. Competitors make us better. BA has to provide a better service. But now, in its centenary year, the company is setting off on a journey of its own. It's going to arrive a bit early. Earlier the better. To transform itself back into the world-class airline it once was. Everything has changed, apart from our salt and pepper. It's a tough world now in aviation, so we need to move on. As British Airways begins its multi-billion pound makeover, our cameras have been allowed exclusive access to all areas of the business. From the factories where the airline buys its state-of-the-art jets... I just think aeroplanes are beautiful. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. 
to the engineers who keep them in the air. When you're working on a plane that weighs 300 tonnes, there's going to be problems as we go through. If you can play an Xbox, you can push out a plane. From trouble at the top... I get pissed off when people criticise VA. If someone criticises VA, they're criticising me. ..to the teams on the ground... One of the machines has broken down. Do you know how to turn this off? I can't turn it off. ..and the people who keep the passengers smiling. If we don't deliver, the airline doesn't deliver. In this episode, is the arrival of the airline's new £300 million plane in for a bumpy landing? Yeah. That's going to be a bit of a challenge. Their design team, their engineering need to assess and, and come up with a, a design solution for that. There's turbulence ahead as the pilots are put through their paces. Wind shear, wind shear, wind shear. Wind shear. Go around, wind shear ahead. And there's a flying visit from royalty, if the airline can get their HQ fit for a queen. All the crowds are in position, the press are here. What could possibly go wrong? Make a lot of noise when you see it. Any airline the size and scale of British Airways faces threats to its reputation. BA has faced a lot of challenges throughout its 100 years of history. And it's gone through wars, it has gone through major financial events, terrorism acts. Uh, it's gone through everything. The last few years have seen BA dealing with costly IT issues. They say they have now resolved the technical issue and flights are returning to normal. A record fine from the Information Commissioner. 380,000 customers caught up in the colossal data breach. And threats of industrial action from a pilot's union. But while the airline contends with those current concerns, it also has to look to the future and the next chapter in its history. And that story starts here in southern France. This is the Airbus final assembly line in Toulouse, or as it's known by the people who work here, the FAL. Currently around us there are seven aircraft in uh, different stages of build. The way we build aircraft is a kind of sophisticated airfix kit. In this gigantic building, the component parts of planes arrive from all over Europe before being assembled. The aircraft, when we've joined all the sections together, uh, typically occupy an area that's about that of a football pitch. So think of seven football pitches joined together. It's phenomenal, the logistics of this aeroplane. You know, the work share across Europe, you think we've got, I think, six or seven different plants, but all these major constituent assemblies, these sections are coming from, and all coming to on time, on quality, to be put together in the final assembly line here in Toulouse. They use belugas, obviously, to ship the sections on frequent daily flights. Um, yeah, so it's something special. Beluga is the name given to these specially adapted A300s that fly the various sections in for assembly. On the production line today is BA's very first Airbus A350, and the person responsible for overseeing the build is the airline's man on the ground, Richard Mee. I've been here three years now, right from the beginning of the 350 programme. This aircraft actually started production at section level back in uh, July last year. Typically, from the, the first components that arrive here, which are, are in fact completed sections or completed wings, that goes quite quickly. So from that point to delivery, we're talking four to five months. Each pre-manufactured section of the A350 is numbered and must be assembled in precisely the right order. So we start off with the heart of the structure, which is called the centre wing box, which is this area here. We then add sections at the forward fuselage, which is 11 to 14, and the aft fuselage, 15 to 19. Whilst that's being built, the wings are being produced in Broughton in the UK, um, and then they're sh shipped to uh, Bremen in Germany for equipping, where they fit all the flight control surfaces, actuators, piping, etc. Um, and then you've got the VTP, and the HTP, so that's the vertical tailplane, the horizontal tailplane, followed by the wing joining, landing gear on, and then we start with the engine installation uh, and all the production testing. The design and manufacture of aircraft like the A350 is helping to take the aviation industry to new levels of comfort and efficiency. This aircraft burns 25% less fuel than the aircraft it replaces, which means 25% lower carbon emissions and it's about 50% quieter. The direct competition is a Boeing 787. Two super efficient aeroplanes, composite, 
based aeroplanes, um, yeah, and, and to have a fleet comprising of both types is really advantageous for us as an airline. But the airline only benefits if the plane is ready on time. This first aircraft for BA is uh, two to three months away from delivery as, as we see it today. We've got no tolerance to a delay. Uh, it's critically important for us to deliver on time and on quality because for an airline, uh, that two to three months is well within the time frame where they're already selling tickets. Coming up, with just weeks until it takes to the skies, is the latest addition to the BA fleet in for a bumpy ride? Uh, no, it's, that's not what we agreed. What we agreed is that uh, nylon stoppers are going to be installed here. And will the new plane's pilots make heavy weather of their simulator training? Wind shear, wind shear, wind shear. Go around. Every six months, each of the airline's 4,500 pilots has to come here, to the Sim Hall, a former hangar that's been converted into a state-of-the-art training facility. These simulators cost over £10 million each, and the airline has 16 of them, so the pilots can practice on every type of aircraft in the fleet. This is where pilots hone their skills, and of regular routine checks every six months, those skills are rechecked. Today, Phil is putting two experienced pilots through their paces. They're part of a group of hand-picked crew who will get to fly the brand new A350 when it arrives. But will they reach the required standard? They're highly experienced A380 pilots, and so we are doing a relatively short conversion just to highlight the fundamental differences so that they can fly that aircraft seamlessly and to the best of its advantage. It's strangely familiar. Hmm. What a standby. There's always that slightly schoolboy smile about it because it is just an amazing piece of equipment and it's an amazing opportunity that we have day in, day out just to work with this kind of equipment. Sim experience is a regular part of a pilot's training because as the planes become more advanced, the pilots have to keep up. Okay, guys, are you ready to run? The whole point is technology is so reliable nowadays that pilots don't get the exposure they may have historically had to dealing with unusual situations. So every six months they, they are brought into the simulators and they are challenged with unusual situations so they can maintain and hone their management and flying skills. Really? Simulators are about being prepared for every eventuality and it's the beauty of the fact that we can put guys into simulators and create things that we would never see in a career and it means that we can give the pilots confidence in what they're doing and they can experience stuff without ever putting a threat to an aeroplane. Traffic, traffic, level off. Sim realism is something we absolutely strive for because the more believable it is then therefore the more our pilots can react appropriately rather than thinking, oh, I'm only in the simulator. And we really do, our pilots come out, you will see beads of sweat from the guys. The guys will show real physiological reactions to the fact that they feel like they're in a real aeroplane. Now, after just an hour at the controls, the real test for the pilots is about to begin. OK, then, guys, so we're going to look at wind shear now, wind shear recovery in the aircraft protections. We're going to start exploring some unpleasant environmental conditions. So I'm going to set a storm up to the northwest of the airfield and very unpleasant winds which will make the aircraft unpleasant to fly. Although rare, wind shear poses a very real threat to planes, especially during takeoff and landing when it can make the aircraft difficult to control. So it's time to see if our pilots today have got what it takes. Wind shear, wind shear, wind shear. British Airways has a long association with the royal family, from state visits to the official opening of their London headquarters. And to mark their 100th anniversary, the airline is preparing for a very special visit. Right, everyone, five o'clock. We've got the Queen coming in the morning. We've got a lot to do before then. David Granger is part of the team responsible for making sure the visit goes without a hitch. But with less than 24 hours to go, will the HQ be ready on time? 
Right, uh, going to run through some of the main actions. Uh, the trackway is installed, so we've got about 200 metre trackway in the building now. Uh, we've got... Another key member of the team, and the man responsible for coordinating the whole visit, is Sam Pritchard, a man with an eye for detail. Waterside mod is the scratch. Are these guys moving the furniture out? I think we need to declutter this a little bit. And we happy with that plant remaining there? I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not, but maybe for a royal event, being a perfectionist might be a good idea. That looks straight to you. Yeah. Why are those ones much lower and these ones much higher? Because they need to be twisted and stretched. Mm. The distance is the same. Oh, really? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, so we need to twist and stretch? It's definitely the most exciting thing that's happened here since I've been working in this office, and I've been working in this office for almost 10 years. Uh, we're closing down the whole office, so about 3,500 people who normally work here uh, won't be coming into work, uh, but we have 1,000 invited guests, um, and they'll be joining in the centenary celebrations uh, of the Queen's visit. But shutting down the head office of an airline isn't straightforward. Obviously, there are some people that need to be in the building um, because without them, the planes wouldn't take off. So we have, we've had to make special arrangements for those, for those to be in the building. Um, but there are also quite, um, quite detailed security requirements in terms of um, access and uh, how people get into the building, what time they arrive. Um, so even that, as a logistical exercise, has been pretty complex. One of the biggest challenges for the team is the building itself. This building is built with a cobbled street through the middle, which obviously isn't the uh, most ideal for a 93-year-old head of state to walk through. So we've had to put a temporary flooring down, which is being covered as we speak. The building has to be ready on time for the Queen's visit, so the airline has brought in an army of workers. So we've got 10 rolls, so it's about 700 square metres of carpet. So give or take a little bit of waste here and there. But with the flooring still going down and time marching on, David has already spotted a problem. There's an area of cobbles which we are carpeting. Uh, unfortunately, because of the slope into the centre of our building, there's uh, an uneven part of the walkway. It's perfectly safe to walk on now, but we obviously want to make sure it's as, uh, as sound as, as possible. And complications like these can have a massive effect on the team's already tight schedule. We've still got a lot to do. Logistical stuff like hanging bunting, uh, putting up barriers uh, for, for the guests and the walkways. Uh, we've got to put up signage so because we're changing how the building is operated. So we need to make sure people know where they're going on the day as well. So what time do you want to do the signage? Uh, after this. After seven o'clock. After we've had pizza. Okay. Right, carry on. So when I was put onto this. Three or four weeks ago, I was told, oh, it's, it's just a small thing on the side, on, on the side of your other project. It'll be about, be about two hours a week. Uh, and it's basically sort of taken over everything. Um, David said to me the other day that he's seen me more than he's seen his wife recently. I don't know what that says about our working relationship or his relationship with his wife. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> yeah. And they'll be seeing even more of each other as they battle through their list of jobs. So we've still got a lot to do. We've got a uh, flag to put up before we lose sunlight outside. We've got it the right way up. I think so. Type Big white band at the top. Yeah. We've got yeah. ex-military man here, so... <laughs> Would you like me to say a few words? <laughs> oh, look at the flag flying fantastically well. That wind we ordered. I'm a little bit nervous that the evening is carrying on. It's getting a bit later, and I'm aware that there is a lot to get done, and you know, I'm not leaving until it's done. Back in the sim hall, and Captain Phil Ticehurst is about to take the Airbus A350 training to a new level by simulating a challenging scenario for any pilot. Wind shear. A thunderstorm or something of that type will have very strong forces, often down and out. Those rapid changes in wind is a wind shear. So we're, we're creating a real disturbance in what is naturally making the aircraft fly smoothly. OK then, guys, I've created a storm which is out to the northwest of the airfield. What are your first thoughts in terms of a go around? We negotiate something with ATC that if we needed to go around, we'd we want to go off the left, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. Fortunately, these aircraft have incredible sensors on them, 
way, will actually sense those threats and give the pilots an early warning so that they can then manoeuvre away from the threat. That heading's probably good if we have to go around. Right. The challenge as pilots is first to understand the technology they've got, but also to embrace that within their normal human skills to react at a controlled pace. So the aircraft will tell him that there's a wind shear issue ahead. Mike will respond, wind shear toga. Toga is a short name for takeoff go around power. So Mike will initiate an aborted landing, a go around, by calling wind shear toga. Wind shear, wind shear, wind shear. Alpha 4 SRS go around track. Go around. Ahead. So we can create pretty much anything. We can basically change the weather to our needs. We can create storms, snow, sunshine, sandstorms. Uh, we can even create bird strikes. So we can have, uh, have birds come near the aircraft. And we can also create a, a host of failures beyond just engine failures, technical failures, electrical failures, all of which is designed to challenge the pilot. The scenario we just carried out in the simulator is something that could happen. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. I've had blustery days, but I've not met as severe conditions as we've just practiced in just now. So not surprising, our two guys, they're very experienced Airbus pilots. They had a very good day out today. Great performance from both of them. When the first aircraft's ready for delivery, they will most likely be the guys that bring our first aircraft over. Everyone's very excited about it. Um, it's, it's personally a privilege. Um, and uh, a, a challenge that everyone wants to, to meet. I can't wait for it to turn up. The, uh, the simulator's great, but there's nothing like getting your hands on the real aircraft when you can actually smell the jet fuel. At Waterside, the airline's HQ near Heathrow, the team are busy preparing for tomorrow's very special guest. The Queen will be arriving uh, on site just after 11 o'clock. She'll be stopping uh, at the Waterside model, so she'll be seeing a model of the building she is in. Uh, she will then be visiting the Speedbird Centre, where we've got lots of BA memorabilia from our 100 years of history. The Speedbird Centre houses the airline's heritage collection, and in honour of Her Majesty's visit, they've laid on a special exhibition of some previous royal encounters. In 1947, she came down to London Airport to name a, uh, an aircraft. It was named Elizabeth England, and here she is actually performing the ceremony by pouring some cider over the aircraft nose. But this is the original paperwork from the arrangements for the day, saying the princess will be happy to come and name your aircraft for you. At the end of the visit here, uh, we'll ask her to sign the Royal Visitors Book. We'll ask her to sign at the back here after that last flight from Singapore, which was in 2011. And there it is there, her signature back in 2011 with the prince. So she'll sit down, hopefully, and sign the next page so we can bring it up to date, which is rather nice. As part of the celebrations, the team will be displaying a unique piece of aviation history. One of the key things that we're uh, putting in place is Concord nose cone. So it normally sits in a quite a discreet part of our headquarters. We're moving that from one end down to where the Queen and our chief executive and chairman will give a presentation and uh, unveiling of the plaque. But it wouldn't be complete without its pressure-sensing tip, known as a pitot tube. <laughs> and this pitot tube fits right on the nose of Concorde, and actually we're going to attach it with our colleagues from Properties onto actual Concorde radome for Her Majesty to see when she comes down the street tomorrow. Hello, Jim. Have you got the pitot tube? Here it is. Oh, okay. Received in good order. Thank you, Jim. This is the tube that covers it up there. So I need it back after Her Majesty's visit. In good order? Of course. We'll very take good. very good care of it. Please, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good luck. I'll come and see it. Okay, thank you. And with the final bit of the puzzle installed, this iconic piece of avionic history takes pride of place. So, with the nose cone assembled, David and Sam can now walk the route the Queen will take in the morning. But it's not long before there's another issue. We're just looking here, we've got a drop down here, so we're just talking about whether we put tape along it or we uh, let Alex know that uh, there's a drop. Need to do both. Both yeah, tape I think so. Yeah. So the brief is to have basically a, a, a completely smooth walkway all the way through. And just because we've got a little bit of a step into one of her, one of her stops, and we've just got to basically tell Alex, who's escorting her around, who's the CEO, uh, to make sure that he basically tells her about the step. 
finally David and Sam call it a night and set off for a well-earned rest. But with such a big day ahead, switching off might be a problem. I don't want to do auto-tuning. It's how, how do we turn it off a television? This is so bad. If the Queen comes in and it says no stored channels found, I mean, that is just not good. Now it's a weak signal. We could just unplug it. Oh, look. Can I do that? Yeah. There are controls here, actually. OK, that didn't do anything. <laughs> Me unplugging it didn't do anything. Because this is the first thing the Queen's going to see when she walks into the waterside. And at the minute, it says, oh, yes, we got it off. Yes. Did that work? What did you, what did you do? What did you press? I took did power out. You took power out. <laughs> right, next. Coming up, judgment day for the A350. Would the plane be up to scratch? Somebody's wondering about the screwdriver and, and dinging my lovely air. Well, yeah. And the impending royal visit calls for a bit of crowd control. If you're not a yellow, move to the side. If you're yellow, follow me. The airline has faced criticism in recent years for their long-haul business class, or as they call it, Club World, with some passengers claiming the cabin was dated. So with the arrival of the A350, the airline has refreshed the club cabin with a brand new seat, and it's made here in Northern Ireland. We're in the main assembly shop floor in Collins Airspace in Kilkeel. This facility has been manufacturing aircraft seats uh, since the mid-1960s. We produce about 120,000 seat places per year. Uh, that's roughly about a seat every two and a half minutes. Yes, we've had a long-standing relationship with British Airways. We've been manufacturing seats for them for at least the last 13 years. The current platform, the, uh, the Club World Suite, uh, has been two years in the development. Uh, and we've worked very closely with, with the BA team in delivering the product that they want. The A350 fleet will need over a thousand of these seats that have a host of new features, including a sliding door. We developed a, a unique safety feature for the door so, because the door has to be stowed during taxi takeoff and landing. Uh, it involves the, the movement of those two buttons by the, the cabin crew to deploy the door. But with so much riding on this seat, the airline wants to make sure the quality of the build is second to none. I have certain qualities that need to be met. There's certain things that BA like to see, so obviously all the stitching needs to be correctly. They all need to be in line. The headrest needs to be touching. and This bottom legrest cover needs to be touching the backrest, so when it's fully extended, it's the most comfortable. And then this side preference needs to be nice and tucked in, and no creases on it as well. Before it's signed off, Every aspect of the new seat, no matter how small, has to be checked and confirmed it matches with the specifications set by the airline. Okay, so this is a force gauge. It's a resistance gauge, and we use it to check that the door is not too loose or it's not too tight. So this one's 7.7, .7 and our tolerance is 10, so we're well within tolerance. So this seat's going good so far. Uh, we don't currently have no defects in this seat, which is very good, so hopefully it'll stay that way. This is the, the 205th suite up the end of the production line and it's now been boxed up through the quality inspection and it's been boxed up now to be put on the truck and uh, taken across the Toulouse to be installed in the aircraft. Back in France, the last of the seats is being installed and the cabin is nearing completion but there's no time to sit around. This is the first A350 that we deliver in uh, July, and it's the first of 18 aircraft. And for me personally, seeing all the hard work over the past four to five years coming together, and there's actually the output from that, I think it's just been great. Now that the interior has been kitted out, the moment of truth has arrived, and so have BA's inspection team. How are you doing, mate? All right? They're here to make sure the airline is getting exactly what they've ordered. This is the opportunity for us to review this cabin, and it needs to be perfect. We've got some technical experts from engineering, but also the product and design team, so they'll be able to inspect and confirm that, you know, what, what we've got is what we, uh, what we signed up to. So at the moment, I'm just checking that the door uh, runs freely on its runners. 
there's no bumps, there's no shuddering, it's a smooth free movement, no noises as it does that. And then the other thing I'm checking is for the latching that it goes into its correct takeoff and landing positions. But just when things look like they're running smoothly, there's always a catch. So just the latching mechanism, it's a bit stiff. I'm not happy with that, so we'll get the seat manufacturer to have a look at it, or for Airbus, because they've done the installation, and they'll have to continue to work it until we get exactly what we're looking for. We've got a real specific attention to detail, right down to the trim finish. It's absolutely meticulously inspected. Let's be honest, I'm not expecting to find a seat missing. But if we find something today or any other team find a defect today, we have a, what we call a customer logbook, and we can raise that defect or finding an Airbus, and the suppliers together must collectively come up with a solution to that. So I'm just going to look at what they call the non-textile flooring. So it's called NTF and it's in the galleys. And we're going to have a look at that, making sure it's been installed correctly. And it's not long before Richard spots a problem. That aft corner seems missing sealant. I'll get the AM. I'll wait now. So it's just for the sealant finish. It's not uniform across the back. It's obviously been a galley area, wet area. You know, it's imperative that, you know, it's going to function. So they just need to reapply some sealant there, really. So every minute flaw is now being pointed out and logged. But could this lead to some hard feelings? It's about having those really difficult conversations and then we can say that we've delivered the best aircraft, the best A350, the best product for the airline. Uh, no, we, that's not what we agreed. What we agreed is that nylon stoppers are going to be installed here to avoid flashing the door hinge opening at the left left side. That's the challenge, you know, it's about doing the right thing. They want to do the right thing for Airbus. They want to deliver a world-class product. We want to receive that and operate it, you know, and our passengers want to share that experience. Did we know about this, Danny Sharp, what we're saying? No, we knew well, about this, this plan. This is the first time I've ever seen this. Yeah. What I'm lost with is, yeah. was this not proposed, you know, with part of the acceptance that this is what the athletic looks going to be? And... No, not this, no, not right, this okay. detail. Not this detail. Right, okay. Okay. As the inspection continues, the list of imperfections gets longer. Really? No uh, one can just you know, open this door for us. I, you know, they told me that they have an issue to put uh, yeah. the, the panel. This door should be a push latch, so you push it, should open, it doesn't do that. This latch is too hard. The blackheads are not color matching with the background. And this is a custom facing um, monument, so it has to be absolutely perfect. But despite how it might look on paper, the team are actually very impressed with the work so far. Yeah, genuinely a bit of a wow factor. You know, first time you see it, it is an impressive cabin. Some minor adjustments to make, raise some points throughout the team. Um, but so far, so good. With any aircraft delivery, there's always risk. Anything could go wrong at the last minute. That's just the nature of a delivery a of a brand down. new aircraft. Um, and it does put pressure on us as a delivery team. And that's because passengers are already booking seats on this plane's first flight in just 10 weeks' time. We have a full program back at Heathrow waiting for this aircraft to, to deliver. So with the plane nearing completion and its pilots up to speed, it just remains for the airline to make sure its roster of cabin crew are prepped for the big arrival. Although all aircraft follow the same basic design, the crew must be familiar with every subtle difference between makes and models. If the cabin crew aren't ready, the plane doesn't fly. I'm here today to do a training course for the A350 for a group of our current cabin crew members who will be picking up the A350 as a new aircraft type. So some of the systems will be new for them, some of them it will be familiar stuff. Today's course focuses on a key feature the new plane's door. Welcome to your A350 door. Uh, you're all used to operating on the single aisle Airbus, so you'll find that this door is very similar to what you're used to with a single aisle Airbus. There's just a couple of extra little bits and pieces. The mode selector will be... We'll be assessing them practically throughout the course, but at the very end, there will be a knowledge check, and the knowledge check is a pass or fail. What's the first thing that I need to check? Check the doors. Yep, so quick look to make sure my door is locked, which it is. And then... I think the doors is always the thing that everybody worries about. There's so many little bits to it and having to do everything in the right sequence in the right order. That can be um, a bit of a challenge when you're being assessed on it, if you like. It's a mechanism for getting our customers on and off the aircraft, but it's also a mechanism for getting our customers and ourselves off the aircraft in an emergency situation. So it's, it is a piece of emergency equipment. But does Helen think they're ready for the real thing? 
They were absolutely brilliant delegates. The experience of flying on the Airbus obviously came through, so they were able to transpose their knowledge onto the new aircraft type, which is absolutely brilliant. We've got a few more bits to do on the rest of the course. Make sure they're ready for that validation at the end of tomorrow. But on the door side of things, they're going to be good crew. It's the early hours of the morning at the airline's head office. Uh, the time is 4.36 a.m. I'm feeling OK, considering I only had one hour sleep. There's still quite a lot to do um, before the marshals arrive at about 6. So we've got to put some of the barriers out, some of the signage out. In less than seven hours, Her Majesty the Queen will be arriving at Waterside, and the team have got their work cut out to make all the final arrangements. Hello, how are we? You all right? Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are we? Seems like only a few hours since I last saw you. First job of the day is get the checklist set. <laughs> it's our birthday and the, the Queen's coming to our party, so yeah. what more could you want than that, really? So <laughs> it's fantastic. As guests and staff begin to arrive, it's up to Sam to keep the registration process on track. Everybody coming up here and also everybody coming in there, just send them over to registration. OK. Thank you. We've got just over four hours left, so it's 7 o'clock, so we've got 20 minutes to the security check and clearance. Once that's done, um, it'll be a lot less stressful, I think. So as David and the police begin the security sweep, Sam is at the other end of the building. Good morning, Sam. How are you? Good morning. I'm all right. Are you all right? Where he has an appointment with the boss. It's an incredible, exciting day. Uh, I've just saw hundreds of colleagues. They've come really early into the office. Um, I think the level of excitement is incredible. Hello, how are you oh, doing? Good I'm to see good. you. Are you all right? All right. Ready how are you go. feeling? Thanks. Feeling good? Fine. I think so. Yes. So we just right. talk through the uh, talk through the meet, okay. talk through the initial bit. As he'll be the one escorting the Queen around the building, Alex has to be alerted to last night's potential stumbling block. We will leave a marker. Whether it's that specific white piece of tape or another piece of tape, we'll make sure there will be a piece of tape on that bit. Yeah. I mean, that's the only place across the whole walk about that uh, has a bit of a step, really. Yeah. Of the yeah. But it seems Sam hasn't prepared for every eventuality. What about the ducks and the swan? Normally, <laughs> 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 they sometimes make make all the way, the way all the way down. Yeah, to we, the we end. haven't we haven't made any special arrangements for the ducks. <laughs> Oh, they just show up. As part of the visit, selected airline staff will be meeting the Queen. Would you be able to tell everyone to be well behaved? <laughs> so there's just time to brush up on a bit of royal etiquette. So when you're presented to the Queen, um, you can either just bow, which is not a full bow from the waist, but just a short bow from the neck, or you can curtsy, which generally is right leg behind left and dip. Um, Please don't touch Her Majesty. <laughs> um, only shake her hand if she offers it. Um, and as I'm sure you've all seen multiple um, greetings, she, it's, it's a very gentle handshake. There's no sort of pumping of arms. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sam has to get the first batch of spectators into position. We need to put the yellows in. are all out of order now. Everybody needs to get out of the toilets and back into the catalogue. Oh, gosh. We need to everybody. All yellow lanyards. All yellow lanyards. All yellow lanyards. Yellow marshals. Uh, here are the yellow marshals. They're ready. If you're not a yellow, move to the side. If you're yellow, follow me. All yellows, yeah. This is the busiest bit because this is the biggest group and it's the most chaotic because we've got all the people in the restaurant. So it will be less chaotic after this. As Alex puts the last minute touches to his speech, the rest of the guests have to be moved into place. OK, we're ready for the green. OK, greens, everybody, follow me. Right, so for 35 minutes to go, we're just doing a couple of final tweets, making sure that everybody's in the right place. I'm going to go and get a management committee who are going to meet the Queen first. And they're hopefully now waiting for us, so we're just going to go and get them. OK, so are you ready? Do it off the carpet, please. Off the carpet. Yeah. <laughs> Alex is there. The Lord Lieutenant is there. The MC are there. All the colleague meeting group groups are there. All the crowds are in position. The press are here. What could possibly go wrong? 
Coming up, with the Royal Party on final approach, there's excitement at the airline's HQ. The Queen is in the building, ladies and gentlemen. And there's a new arrival as BA's brand new A350 finally touches down. Back in Toulouse, and the airline is about to take delivery of its new plane. It's had a final coat of paint, and build and delivery manager Richard has been checking that the issues spotted in the cabin inspection have been sorted. One of the first ones we found was uh, on the galley ovens, we found it clashing with the door. Um, so they've got some door limiters installed now. So as you can see, there's no contact there. One of the other items that we found during the cabin final inspection was the sealant finish in the galley area. It's crucial that this is watertight so they've redone all the sealant to ensure that that is the case. We had a slight issue just with the latching on the sliding door, which is a new feature of the seat, and as you can see, that's all been resolved now. Works perfectly. Final check of the Club World kitchen. As you can see, all those final touches have now been corrected. Everything's finalised and it's perfect, absolutely spot on. So, with the official seal of approval, the plane can begin its short journey to Heathrow before it starts its long-haul career. It's a very proud moment for me um, and the rest of the airline. You can imagine how much work has gone into preparing the base. Um, the, the, the facility here, we've had to get the infrastructure ready for the aircraft. The engineers here, they're now A350 licensed, so they can now work on the aircraft and make sure that the aircraft is serviceable for our operation. And even having these new markings on the ground are so important. And again, it takes quite a lot of time and effort to do that and planning. Before long, the new aircraft makes its entrance. 50, 40, 30. It's a long time coming. It's been fantastic to actually finally get my hands on the aircraft. I mean, uh, not just myself, but the whole airline has spent an awful lot of time preparing for the arrival of the aircraft. To, to finally get to the day when we bring it to Heathrow, you know, marks the closing of one chapter and the beginning of another, really, for, for the airline. With the plane in position, an excited staff and press get a chance to take a look on board. It's a complete step up from the old Club World Cabin for sure. Yeah, you can still smell the kind of brand new airplane smell, which is great. For us nerds, that's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> the press have been all over the cabin today and they've absolutely loved it and all the, the, the feedback I'm getting so far is really positive. Definitely feels wider, doesn't it? It does feel wider. We've spent extra time with the cabin crew going through all the different stowages, really getting to know the aircraft so we can explain to all the other cabin crew and all the other instructors exactly how the aircraft works. Richard has even flown over from Toulouse to welcome the boss on board. And what do you think of the suite itself? The club suite? Oh, yeah, it's great, it's huge. The fact that you can be watching TV throughout the whole time. Excellent. Uh, makes, makes a huge difference. What, what's most exciting to you? The most exciting bit for me, I think, is the sliding door feature. I think the guys in design have done a, a fantastic job. I mean, this is super exciting. Um, this is really where, where we want to be. To see the aircraft now finally at its brand new home at Heathrow is just a very proud moment, but also exciting. I will never forget this day for, for the rest of my life. But for Richard, it's not quite the end of the story. You know, it's a sense of pride more than anything for us, but we've got another 17 of these to deliver, so my job's not even halfway through. Um, so I look forward to that challenge that that brings. Back at the airline's HQ, and after weeks of planning, the big moment has arrived. The Queen's visit is about to begin. Excited, really excited, really excited. And I'm really, really pleased, because there was a lot to do the last few days. I have spent a lot of time in this building. I'm excited, I can begin to relax, maybe. And finally, after all the hard work, Her Majesty arrives. She's here. She is, oh, she looks great. The Queen is in the building, ladies and gents. She is, this is great. Well done, Alex. Well done. It's just sort of surreal. We get to see her again in a minute. So but even now, Sam's job isn't over. We're doing the plaque. Moving the plaque. Good. It's amazing. It's a great way to mark our centenary. So really great to have her here. 
So this is the bit that she needs to pull. The Queen's got such a long history flying with us and uh, I know the guys have put some spectacular stuff together. And as well as meeting and greeting staff in the Speedbird Centre, Her Majesty is reminded of the time she christened an aircraft with cider. Cider? Over, over the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not uh, champagne? I think not. You've got flags yet? Good flags. You make a lot of noise when she comes around when, when you see her. But as they say, the best laid plans... We need to turn around. I'd like to take another wrong way to the speech. And now she's coming back. <laughs> back so soon. <laughs> Woo! Momentarily, uh, she went on a slightly extended route. Offic official spokesman says. It now gives me great pleasure to invite you now to unveil the plaque to mark this historic visit. And then, after marking a hundred years of the airline, the Queen departs for her next royal engagement. That was great. I mean, the enthusiasm uh, from everyone at BA and from her. She was asking questions from our staff. An incredible event. It went by really quickly, but it was really fantastic. Those individual conversations she had with engineers, with pilots, cabin crew, um, the time that she spent here in our museum, looking at her own history through the pictures that, that we have, she has spent quite a bit of time with us, and, and I think she really enjoyed it. Well, it was a bit of a blur, but a wonderful blur, actually. And of course, the day wouldn't have been complete without that all-important signature. So that's her signature today. Huge success. It's an um, absolute privilege to be part of it. Uh, everything went to plan. Uh, the only minor tweak was the slightly longer walking route, but I think that was fine. Everybody laughed at that. I think even the Queen gave us a smile, so that was good. It meant I got to see her a couple more times, so I can't complain of that. <laughs> I have to tell you, I was so excited. And uh, in my head, I just wanted to make sure that we were covering everything. And uh, I forgot I had to give a speech. <laughs> but we recovered, uh, we recovered. And I, I, it was a really rewarding experience to see everyone there and to welcome her uh, and to cheer for her. I think it was, it was fantastic. Jadi peristiwa terperih yang selalu kau beri seakan tak berarti untuk kesekian kalinya ku tak bisa. Berbuat apa lagi Haruskah kita berakhir cukup sampai di sini Meski hati berkata tak mampu Tak ingin terlambat menyudahi keadaan ini Mungkin ini jalan kita Dan lagi terjadi
peristiwa terperih yang selalu kau beri seakan tak berarti untuk kesekian kalinya ku tak bisa berbuat apa lagi. Berkata tak mampu Tak ingin terlambat menyudahi keadaan ini
Hmm. No, you don't want to